welcome to the Game Informer Show. I'm your host, Ben Hansen, joined by Andrew Reiner. Why, hello. Indeed, Joe Juba. Yeah. Yeah. And JV Goldney. Hey, everyone. Hey, welcome. Uh, you're all here. Great to see you. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're talking about a couple games on this show, believe it or not. Uh, new games. Hot off the presses. We have Crash Bandicoot. The <laughs> insane trilogy. Hot off the presses. Everyone's it's talking about new. it. Is that new? <laughs> Ask your creepy uncle. Uh, we're also talking about Valkyria Revolution <laughs> uh, with Joe Juba. Can't wait to dive into that. It's the grand return of Valkyria. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then we're getting weird with JV naturally and talking about Get Even. Which let's let's just leave it ambiguous as to what that is, but right. it is a game that you are excited to talk about. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Most of us don't know much about it except for maybe Reiner. Um, then we have some great emails, and then back after the show, we're joined by uh, video game pioneer, as his official lifetime award uh, decreed him, Eugene Jarvis. Uh, mm-hmm. If you don't know the name, uh, he created some arcade games uh, back in the day: Defender, Stargate, Robotron, Blaster, Narc, Smash TV, the Cruisin series. Uh, so you're saying he's a hack. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's most of the interview is me calling him a hack. Yeah. <laughs> you're Do res- something good. Your resume is pathetic. <laughs> For a bruising. Uh, <laughs> but he's back, everybody. Uh, he's working uh, at a company called Rothrails. He's been there for a while uh, in like the modern arcade scene. Um, so we talk a bit about that and like what it takes to attract an audience in a modern arcade. We talk about barcades. Um, but he's back because he's working with Housemark on their new game, Next Machina, which we talked a little bit about last week. Matt Miller is reviewing it. The review should be up very soon if it's not up already on GameInformer.com. Uh, Matt Miller, believe it or not, loves it. Uh, huh. It's novel for a Housemark game and Matt Miller <laughs> magical love combination. But he he told me to tell everybody out here that uh, he considers the new game Next Machina one of the best arcade games to come out in years and years and years. Uh, was the message? Does he, he just me to list convey. like 1995? That's that's how yeah. 2002. Yeah. I wonder I wonder how he'd compare it to Rezogun because I, I mean that was... implies that he likes it more than Rezogun and he was hot and heavy. Oh with yeah, Rezo he wouldn't Gun. shut yeah. up about it. He really wouldn't. Huh. Uh, but yeah, so we talk about uh, developing that game and the weird collaboration between Eugene Jarvis, this you know legend of the arcades, and Housemark over there in Finland. Uh, it's a fun chat. Uh, so I also bug him about his cameo on News Radio, which I'm surprisingly into because he's in the arcade episode of news radio if you recall that uh and also just picked his brain about what he considers some of the most underrated uh arcade games of all time and uh he came in with a surprising one it was called oops actually it was about birth control i forget if you were the sperm or the egg but (laughs) there was was... sounds like a great interview oh man we have so much to look forward to can't wait uh but for now you want to talk about crush bandicoot sure so, Reiner, you've been yeah. playing this. It's the Grand Remaster from Vicarious Visions. Uh, you know, a couple months ago, we talked to a couple of the leads over there on that team to get some new details on that game. Seems like the audience is very interested in this. In the Grand Return of Crash, is this the Grand Return of Crash? Yeah, it is, actually. And it's there's a lot with Crash going on right now. It was just in Skylanders. Uh, you have, you know, this remake coming out now. Uh, and then it's it's really weird for me to to review this game because... I reviewed the originals back in the day. Like oh, one of my first reviews was, you know, the original Crash Bandicoot game. So to come back to it again and like have these memories of like writing that strategy guide and going to E3 and seeing it beforehand and seeing Miyamoto play it at their tiny little Sony booth, it all came flooding back to me. So for it to be back again is very puzzling, but it's still really fun. Okay. Like uh, hmm. I was. Super surprised. I was going through the first game and I was just kind of like, all right, you kind of see the retro charm of it, but you're like, okay, this is going to get old pretty quick. But Naughty Dog was really clever back in the day in changing up the formula with each level. And that's something like I paid attention to as I played it. It was like they always kind of invented some new challenge in each level. Even if you're running away from the boulder, everybody remembers that sequence, right? Yeah. Where it's like, okay, boulder's coming at us. Second stage, you do that. But then they have different things in the way, like electrical gates or something. Like there's always a little wrinkle that they throw into uh, into these these challenges to change it up. And it's crazy that like going forward with the trilogy too, it just gets more varied. By the time Crash Three comes about, it just feels like seven different game engines and a million yeah. different mini games. And so even with Crash One, you're right. Like especially starting out in the jungle area, and then working your way up into crazy castle fortresses and electromagnetic nonsense. Now here's the weird thing. So Naughty Dog made the original trilogy. That's what put them on the map. You know, Way of the Warrior was kind of a subtle hit for 3DO, but this is what made them a premier development studio, right? Like this is changed the path for it. And they haven't had a, a dud since then, right? Like it's Jack and Daxter, 
Uncharted, Jack X Racing. Yeah, I was going to say they did do the Jack Racing game. Crash Team Racing was very good too. But yeah, they they have knocked it out of the park ever since Crash, so to speak, outside of some little diversions, sure. right? <laughs> uh, but they didn't have anything to do with this remake. Uh, none of their code is in the game. It was all created from the ground up, from scratch, by Vicarious Visions. This is puzzling to me, because you usually hear of games, you know, just get ported over and then they get enhanced as they go along. This one, no, they had to go through and like figure out spin timing, the hit zones, perfect placement of every little box and everything in there. Uh, and Vicarious Visions did a great job doing that and unifying that experience. One thing that's lost in this, if you go back and play the original games on PlayStation, yeah, you're going to see how Naughty Dog learned. They were very young, doing something new in Crash 1. They learned a lot in 2 and again in 3. You see that that arc, right, yeah. of them improving as a development studio and tr- taking different chances. In this game, Vicarious Visions kind of put a layer of polish across all of it. So it's all pretty even. It all feels like 1 to 3 all feels like it's kind of shot fired at the same time because they went back and like added in checkpoints and uh, kind of softened yeah. crash one right and, and little things like crash has a silhouetted shadow opposed to just the little dot goes a long way in telling you where you are in in mm. jumping and what animation you're in and all that kind of stuff mm. it, it helps and they smoothed out his movement a little bit in that first one uh so you lose that kind of evolution of that series in that but it is a better game to play now like they reduced a lot of th- the frustrations from Crash 1 by adding those checkpoints, uh, adding in a uh, uh, unified save system across all three games with autosave, which is awesome. Uh, I did run into a couple crashes. <laughs> mm, nah. uh, yeah, uh, a couple crashes that uh, sent me back to the dashboard and came back, but the autosave had saved my progress. Huh, and you're playing on PS4. It's only out on PS4. Only on PS4 at this point, right? Like, I don't know if Activision is going to end up moving it to Xbox One and PC at some point. I don't know. It seemed, I don't know if that'd be part of the contract. Skylanders wasn't a uh, crash in the Xbox One? I don't. I thought he was a PlayStation exclusive. Yeah, but you know that's know. franchise so much better than yeah, I, don't I do. So right. here's my question about this. Let's say that someone is not particularly interested in the historical appreciation of Crash. They're coming in fresh to this whole thing? Coming in fresh Those to this. Those people do not exist. And, they, and they're just like, oh, Crash Bandicoot, I hear people say this is a good platformer. I played ukulele last year. Will I like Crash Bandicoot? Yes, you will. The games are still, like I said, the games are still fun. And it kind of shows you something that's missing in games today, which is you finish levels in like a minute and a half sometimes. And you're just moving from one challenge to the next. And they all yeah. feel different. Hmm. And it's not just the same thing over and over and over. Like a Super Meat Boy is like challenging and fast, but it is a lot of the same thing, right? Yeah. This one, they'll throw curveballs at you, different challenges. Uh, gameplay mechanics and by the end you're just like wow that was awesome it didn't feel like it was going too long or it was repeating too much Uh, it's interesting I feel like I just watched the Jeff Keighley had a panel at E3 which is really good uh, with a lot of like the original Crash developers Mark Cerny and Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin uh, some other folks Uh, and even they seemed like we're like yeah that Crash won Boy, some of those levels were stupid like (laughs) I think they they naturally uh, you know think of those games as being really well done but even they were like crash one is pretty rough in some spots but you didn't really feel that playing that in 2017 no there are a couple levels that are really hard okay like really hard but again different like all of a sudden it's like hey here's a broken bridge oh god in the sky yeah (laughs) that that are falling and i was just like you know what i'm friends with jason rubin he's far removed from the game now i texted him i was like who's the who made this level and he's like that was me. And he's like, <laughs> I should have been fired for making that level. I totally remember that. That was uh, brutal. And he said he, he he had some like variations in the early versions of the game where he had to jump like forward three boards and then back one and then ahead forward. And he said it was like a mathematical equation to getting across it. He said <laughs> it was unsolvable in human time. Like oh no one would God. be able to do what he wanted to do originally. And this is like the scaled back easy version of it. And I was like, you just wasted like 20 of my lives in this game. <laughs> like, I'm trying to review this thing. Oh, uh, so there God. are still those moments of like, this is still hard. And the new checkpoint system doesn't really alleviate that too much because just some of those challenges are really tough, right? Yeah. Like flipping over a turtle and, you know, doing the charge bounce across it so you can, and you got to have perfect timing. Like they set up these 
these jumps where there's no leeway in you got to hit it right at the end and land uh, right on the beginning of the, of the lip of the, the platform. Like that's how those those challenges are made in that game. And that's part of its charm, though. Like you cannot remove that. Otherwise, it just won't be fun anymore. Yeah. What uh, do you think about the art? I, every time I see it, I feel like it's going to take a while to get used to it. Not that the original games were the most beautiful in the world. I, don't, I think it's tough for the original PlayStation yeah. to hold up that well. But eh. that series does hold up on PlayStation 1. The colorful foliage stuff like that still yeah. looks really good and crashes simple shaded. They didn't do like ugly PlayStation textures like you see in Tomb Raider, right? Where it's no. like you can't even look at a wall anymore. It's like, oh my God, I thought this was like a tomb. What is this? <laughs> looks like crap. Uh, but that game actually kind of held up a little bit. Uh, this new version, obviously being built from the ground up, takes advantage of the latest in PlayStation technology. It looks stunning at times. Like there's Re some texture. Stunning. Work. Yeah, like when you're on the blimp battling Cortex, I yeah. couldn't. I, I kept looking at the texture of the blimp because it was really cool, like kind of stitched oh. patterns. Hmm. Uh, and then the foliage and the the backgrounds too. Sometimes you'll it'll open up a little, and you can see out to the distance things you've never seen before in in the series. Where it's like, whoa, I get to see more of Wumpa Fruit Island or whatever. <laughs> like. Uh, so Please, yeah, give it looks, Fruit Island its dignity, Reiner. Don't scoff at that. <laughs> it looks good. You know, some of the some of the enemy designs, the original polygons they're kind of based on are a little rough, but they tried to touch it up a little with texture. But they didn't mess with any anything, writing. Right? Like Ripper Roo's still in there, oh, the yeah. weird gangster bandicoot, they're all stripe, there. they're yep. all in there. All of them and are the there. voice acting, some are different, but they all seem okay. It's great. Yeah. Oh, I think okay. uh, I think it all works. And as a new playable character, too. Oh yeah. Coco, uh, you could play as her at any point. You can just switch to her by uh on the I guess the HUD or the the map yeah. and, and switch to her and she plays just like Crash. Obviously, they didn't change any of the timing, but she has kind of less attitude in, in her <laughs> in her I'm jumps. I'm looking forward my 90s. Know, she's yeah, not I'm, doing the Van Halen jump and stuff like that. She's yeah. a little bit more graceful. I think you have to call uh, it Tood if it's from this <laughs> era. Yeah. Uh, here, here's the key question. Because especially like the challenge levels, you're like working as Crash, the 2D stuff to get back to your super hot Bandicoot girlfriend. So as Coco... Are you still like working to get Crash's girlfriend and then celebrating oh, yeah, yeah, by yeah. making out with yeah, her? Yeah, that's the same thing. <laughs> do they really do the same <laughs> yeah, thing? Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay, sure. Yeah, it's a friend, maybe. Yeah, right? it's a, you know, it's 21st century. Let the family do what they want to do. <laughs> I don't know if they changed the ending to have her hugging the girlfriend or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. And riding the bird to safety, hey, like Lord of the somewhere. Rings kind of thing. I don't know. Um, find your love where you find it. I thought he was a spinner, not a swinger. But Ooh. PlayStation 4... PlayStation 4 has a lot of great collections. This is another one. I think they did a great job. A hell of a development effort in remaking all three of these games. Yeah. I don't know why they didn't just make one new game. That's what people really don't want. Is, I don't know. I don't think so. You don't think people want a new Crash Bandicoot? I in think, that style, I, I think that'd be great. Now that they have the chops, I mean, they should do it. I think this is totally just a stepping stone to that. I, right. I, I'm I mean, sure like, I think, it is. I think that's I hope the so. point. Unless this yeah. thing bombs and then it's, yeah. it's over. I think it might be a safer bet overall to play off nostalgia instead of having a wave of people be like, that's not my crash. I'm sure there's yeah. still that fan base that'll say this about the remake, but it might be a safer play overall. But the weird thing, Naughty Dog's name, nowhere on this. The only place you'll find it is in Vicarious Visions Special Thanks. It just says... Naughty Dog. What, what would you No want? Andy Gavin, no Jason Rubin, what would be your no Mark Cerny. What would be your ideal level of like tip of the cap to those guys? You fire up the game, it says Vicarious Visions, it says Activision, it says Naughty Dog. Gives them their logo. They made it's the game. It's their game. I mean, I'm on they I'm on They made Reiner's the games. Yeah. They just copied down to the very pixel the yeah. same game. I'm trying to think of other Something happened there. I, I wonder if Naughty Dog just wouldn't want that because they wouldn't want just in case the remake the remaster Socks. didn't go well yeah, but it's yeah and games. they don't want the Naughty Dog logo on that because that carries a lot of weight what if it said like originally designed by sure or created by you know what I mean like attempted to be remade from <laughs> but right there it's like for me that has like Joe was saying the person that's new to it for me that's started with these games it's like this is a weird way to jump into this like why didn't they get any credit it's their games I, I kind of get what Ben's saying though like you know, Naughty Dog, like, as you were saying early, earlier, Naughty Dog hasn't had, like, a miss since Crash. So for them to, like, put their logo on something, on, you know, something means something, right? Like, that's almost like an implied seal of approval. I, maybe the, instead of the logo, I think the classy way to go, and I I don't know, I'm okay with it being in the credits. Like, I think people understand that it's a remaster, you know? Uh, but just, like, a maybe on the loading screen, just be, like, 
Yeah. Hey, Spe- did you know? <laughs> These or just were originally spe- created by. A special thanks to the original team or just like something quick on that loading screen. It's it's a prime real estate, but I think hey, that would be. stole a- your identity. It's identity theft. It's over. I don't think it's, it's that bad. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's quite that bad. <laughs> Joe, what if- There's a conspiracy behind this. Is it too much, Joe? Are we old timers? Prosecute them. Yep. Yeah. Come on in here. Okay, all right. Cool. Let's go. <laughs> uh, all right. So recommend to fans of platformers. Well, yeah, it's a really good game, but don't play it because Naughty Dog didn't it doesn't have the logo. On. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to put their logo on that thing. <laughs> I'm excited. Like th- this, the Crash One in particular means a lot to me. Like PlayStation was like my first console, and that was my first game for that first console. So yeah. I'm excited to go back to it. I yeah. just I remember during the Uncharted Four Game Club, you wouldn't shut up about that uh, the inclusion of Crash in there. Well, too. you guys, God, the frustrating part. I went back and listened to that before Uncharted Lost Legacy cover <laughs> story, and there was an argument which I still got mad about, where I called it like special or like wild that they included crash one and uncharted four and joe and everybody else was like what are you talking about it's their it's their game it's not that weird they did it it's like it's remarkable it's "It's really cool no everyone else is like it's not remarkable in any way there's some like argument about whether or not it was remarkable (laughs) that's one of the few remarkable things about uncharted four is that sequence oh here we go you know what what it is it's that conspiracy that's them reminding people they knew this new collection was in the works (laughs) and they're like we freaking made this. Yeah. This is our game. Remember. I don't, I don't think that, that No, happened. we didn't. Actually, we talked to Evan this. Wells about it uh, in a video interview in our Uncharted Last Legacy Hub, if you want to talk about that. He's the president of Naughty Dog now. And if you listen that. to every other word, the truth is there. That's right. Uh, cool. Well, I'm excited to <laughs> What do the vowels mean, Mason? <laughs> <laughs> That'll be neat. So, uh, yes, play it. I think it's $39. It's it's totally worth your time. There we go. Insane good time. Joe. Speaking of $39. Valkyrie Revolution? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's 40 Is that right? Yeah. So, this is... The Curia Chronicles, you guys have been the fan base, uh, you know, based on last week's podcast, the fan base that would not stop clamoring. We need the new Valkyria game. You finally got it, right? No more remakes, no more remasters. This is a new one, right? <laughs> no. Oh. Uh, I mean, yes. Yeah. Well, yes. It It is a new entry that has the name Valkyria in it. Well, there we go. That's everything fans want. You want to move on to get even? It is a... Uh, so Valkyria Revolution is a spinoff from Valkyria Chronicles. So Valkyria Chronicles is a three-game series, the third of which has not been brought to North America. Mm. And they're on PSP? Uh, two and three are on PSP. Okay. And the first one was on PS3, and now right. it's on PC and PS4. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so what this is... So Valkyria Chronicles is a uh, like a turn-based strategy series. Um, that, you know, includes some real-time elements and you're down on the battlefield and stuff, but it's ultimately a tactical turn-based RPG. It's a codename Steam clone, I think, is it? Oh, okay, yeah. To it. yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> forgot that game even existed until right now. Uh, Valkyria Revolution is a spinoff not only from like a story perspective, but also from a gameplay perspective. So this is just a lot, this is just straight up like an action RPG. This does not have like the turn-based tactical combat that you know that if you're a fan of valkyria chronicles that you would expect sega has been upfront about this so like it's not like they're trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes they've been upfront about the fact like this is a spin-off look Don't trust us you'll be disappointed i don't know how many times we have I to mean, warn you kind of yeah oh, like, like, like that that's a little bit of the tone i mean they haven't been saying that but they have been saying from the beginning like this is not a new valkyria chronicles game um so combat, instead of being this like turn-based tactical affair, feels a lot more like like a Dynasty Warriors game. It's a lot more just like one, you know, a small squad versus a whole legion of enemy soldiers and tanks and whatever, and you're going in there. And instead of like the ranged combat, you're in there with like melee, your swords and axes and hacking up dudes. And But the world of Valkyria is cool, so that must be cool to see that. I, and- I you know, I don't even think it's in the same world. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Holy hell. So hard pass. Why so did they make this? It's set. That is an excellent question. And something, <laughs> that, something that came to me multiple times as I, as I was reviewing this game. Because, like, ultimately it just feels like, like, I don't know who this game is for. Like, it's certainly not for fans of Valkyria Chronicles. Because it's a diversion in so many ways. But then it's like, if you're a fan of action RPGs, it's a bad action RPG also. Oh, God, yeah. And that's, that's actually something I want to emphasize here, too. And I, and I emphasized it in my review also, is that, like, I don't dislike this game because I wanted more Valkyria Chronicles and this isn't that. Yeah. So, thumbs down. Right. 
Like, I don't like this game because it is not a fun game. Like, you, you cut off any legacy attached to the Valkyria name, and you've still got a game that has, like, repetitive and generic feeling combat. It, uh, like, the story sequences are just, like, unbearably long. So you know how how games like Xenosaga on PS2 just got, like, like people, they got a reputation for just having these ridiculously long cutscenes. Yeah. At least with that series, you liked the characters and interesting things were happening mm-hmm. in the cutscenes. So even if sometimes, they were, yeah. yeah, even if they were long, there was at, it was at least exposition that you were interested in. Junior was powering up everything you want. Yeah. <laughs> so like, but in this, in this, it's like the characters are just like so, uh, like. Store brand. They're just like generic characters. Same writers as Puyo Puyo Tetris's campaign, probably. Uh, mm, That's a narrative. It's it's a terrible campaign recently from Sega as well. That's super long too. It really is. But then but then like also just weird things like the camera angles are are like uh, like the scenes are framed badly. So you're just kind of like, why am I during the cutscenes. Uh, yeah, the cutscenes are. But then like animations feel super cheap. So people like like <laughs> so it's the sort of thing where it's like if two characters are done talking, one of them needs to like rotate and pivot before they can start walking away. Okay. So it's it ends up feeling like this weird sort of like choreography as like scenes are happening because anyway. It, Colossal disappointment. Uh, is there anything redeeming about this game? Yeah. Oh. The soundtrack is consistently good. Wait, is it Mitsuda? It is. Yep. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So uh, Yasunori Mitsuda, who I think is probably best known for Chrono Cross, but uh, other stuff out there too. Uh, um, and Chrono Trigger, he did a lot of mm-hmm. too, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Xenoblade. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's got that same sort of like, I don't know, that that majestic sort of European military feel to it. Oh, that, woodwinds? Um, what are we talking about? Oh, well, like uh, drums Percussion. and yeah. I mean, it's got... I, I don't know. I'm not good at describing Lots music. Lots of drums banging. But you're great at <laughs> charades for drums. <laughs> bah, bah, you know bah, bah. this instrument? <laughs> Donkey Congo one? Trumpet. Uh, yeah, so I, I I did enjoy the music, but I mean, ultimately what it boils down to is is regardless of what you expect or don't expect from a Valkyria game, as as just a standalone product, this is like a disappointing story, disappointing characters, dull and repetitive combat, it's, it's just not fun. Here, here's the ideal scenario. Just go on YouTube, pull up some old gameplay videos for Valkyria Chronicles 1, running in HD, uh-huh. and then mute it, and then just turn on the soundtrack for the mm. new game, and you can kind of trick your mind into you thinking it's a whole new experience. What makes me sad about it, though, is that like I'm worried. I mean, If we talk about Crash as being a sort of dipping your toes in the water, be like, well, people want a new Crash game? Yeah. I'm afraid that the powers that be... We're like, well, people said they wanted a new Valkyria. Here you go. And this thing yeah. just, I mean, this thing just sucks. Mm-hmm. So then they're like, well, people don't want more Valkyria. Is it's, it a different developer? Uh, I mean, it, yeah, the, the, the teams are sort of uh, have shifted around. I think this is, I think Media Vision is the hmm. main developer on this. Huh. But, yeah, that, that, that's scary. Uh, if I don't know how you I don't make the case for another tactical Valkyria. It's after Sega, this. right? Yeah. Well, they yeah. keep trying with Sonic. No. <laughs> well, that sells like Game Busters. I mean, oh boy. Yeah. I mean, and that's and that's what's so disappointing. Like, I don't even even if I I guess I've I've resigned myself to the fact like, you know what? We're probably not going to get Valkyria 4. Yeah. But I would at least love to see like an officially localized version of Valkyria 3 mm-hmm. or like a collect, you know, they they've remastered the first one and put it out on PC and PS4. Like maybe put the two PSP ones onto a collection, do some work on those and get yeah. those out there at least. Like I w- I at least want it to go that far. No. It's a monkey's pot situation. Such Give it up. Games. It's over. They yeah. really did like I remember playing the first one shortly after it came out and thinking this is a really good alternative to like Fire Emblem. Like I yeah. really enjoy this game. Yeah. I'd love to see I mean, I'd love to see three like on my PS4. Nope. Yeah, at least. Give I, me more skies of Arcadia. <laughs> <laughs> Quit okay, dealing right. with this Valk crap. We're done. Yeah. It failed. It's over. It's a situation where you wish your loved one would have stayed dead instead of returning as the weirdo zombie <laughs> knocking on your door late at night. Cool. All right. I think there's a twilight zone about that. No, I think that's uh, that is a very apt comparison. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, hey, JV. Yeah. What's up? Finally, something good, something new. Yeah. Okay. Get even. Yeah. Okay. So get even. Where do we start with this mind-bending thriller, yeah. weird-ass game? Uh, it's from the developer 
Farm Fifty One, which Farm? Yeah, Farm Fifty One. Which okay. they're 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 What did you think he said? It just seems like such a god awful name. It is. It's I, a really I convinced bad name. myself that I must have misheard it. <laughs> Farm Fifty One. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait till you hear what they've developed. Uh oh, they did one of the painkiller expansions. If you remember Painkiller, where I you had only remember the, the mediocre. Mistake. Yeah, the yeah. mediocre one. And then they did another game called Deadfall. Which was not good. Which was not good. So I sat down to play this, was like Okay, this is going to be fine. Uh, but it was actually really good. Uh, it's You wake up in an asylum. You are a mercenary who has amnesia. And all you have is a cell phone. And you look across the room and there's like a television screen with a mysterious figure who has like a gender bending voice. So like he'll it talk. It goes a little something like this. No. Come on. Um, <laughs> hey, that, how does it go? Is yeah. that what he did? Like it like alternates, between? Yeah, it alternates between a man and a woman. Yep. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and basically the premise according to this figure named Red, is that you're here for treatment to like recover your memories and stuff. But uh, there's obviously like a bigger mystery uh, at the heart of it all. And so what do happens I, is... Do any horrifying truths become apparent as your amnesiac hero pieces together pieces of, of his past? Holy crap. Did you play it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> it's almost like if then he finds out he was wronged and then it's time to get even. Uh, no, that's actually not Ooh, the twist. Damn it! Yeah, <laughs> I can't be as good as Joe. Uh, but it does. The game gets weird because okay, so you wake up and at first I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be some sort of horror Silent Hill thing where I see like apparitions and you know monsters that mm-hmm. my are represented by my psychological problems or represent my psychological problems. And you see problems. that early on. Right you away. see a little bit of that, but then it takes this weird twist, this weird Assassin's Creed twist where <laughs> oh. it introduces a VR headset that lets you simulate memories. And so you're jumping around in this guy's broken, fractured memories to try and recreate what has happened to both uh, the main character, Cole Black, and the figure, Red. I'm only into this idea if it's like weird, not complete memories where things are like shifting out of yep. existence. So yep. Ooh, you'll okay. go in a hallway, <laughs> open a door, keep opening that door, you keep going forward oh, through the same doorway, yeah. yes. and your character's like starting to freak out. And the music, yeah, the music cues really in this good. game are awesome because he'll be like, that's my favorite song. Doom, <laughs> doom, 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 doom. As you're getting closer and closer, and you'll go for like a minute, minute and a half. You're like, oh my God, something bad's going to happen. When is this going to like peak? Those yeah. classic Mitsuda drums. Um, oh, it's really good. Like, yeah, I was really impressed with the soundtrack. And it's and it's deceptive at first because they've marketed it as like a first person shooter, yeah. but it's it's not completely. It's one of, the, one of my favorite things that games can do is like vary things up. Like for example, one of the reasons I love Titanfall 2 is because even though like that whole game is about shooting bad guys, it disguises that really well. Like you're constantly doing new things. Yeah. And Get Even does that too. So in one segment, you know, you're either sneaking around bad guys or you're shooting them and the gun plays fun. Um, or, and then in the next, you're doing sort of like a criminal investigation sort of thing in the asylum when you're not in the simulation. So you'll have like your cell phone out and it has various apps on it. Like there's an ultra or a UV light. There's like, you know, uh, whatever it is, like infrared sensors. So you can read body heat. Uh, you can take pictures of things for like evidence and you're just gathering evidence to try and like fit together what happened. Sounds cool. It sounds like a lot of opportunities for small little offshoots and you know variations to become pains in the ass, but that's never really the case. No, like, no, oh, no, 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 no. It's it's consistently good and varied. Uh, it's also the the one thing that stuck out to me. There are two things that stuck out to me that might be negative. The first one is it's a janky game. Like it's like sort of not deadly premonition levels of bad, but uh, there were. Hey, hey no, I meant glitch wise. But mm. like there would be He just meant unplayable wise, Joe. <laughs> <Yeah. There laughs> terrible. There were like two occasions where my character would stop moving and I'd have to like reload the game, but it would just uh reload the last checkpoint, but the checkpoints are so generous that it was like two seconds. They should have a context for every glitch too, where it's like that's not how that's I remember feature. it. <laughs> <laughs> um But and then the other thing is it has a very sort of tone clashy story. Like the story goes so many places. There's so many plot twists, like on level. Like it's not as good as Metal Gear Solid Two. I'm gonna say that, but it has like as many plot twists as that game does. Like it's just, nope. yeah, it's just so many. <laughs> Promise False. that's not true. <laughs> no, it does. It does. It has as many. I'm not saying it's as good. It's not as good. Good. Lo- okay. Uh, but there's, but there are just so many plot twists, and the majority of them are interesting. Uh, but the tone's all over the place. There's some wacky moments. Like one of the gadgets you get is called a corner gun, and take a guess at what it does. Corner? Yeah, corner gun. It shoots oh, from corners. is it like a yeah. laptop gun? Oh, okay. No. no. <laughs> so, is it a la- <laughs> so you bend it in half, basically, so it aims at 90-degree angles, right. and it has a view screen, so you like you could be around the corner, 
turn it to the left and then shoot someone. It just sounds like something from Roger Rabbit, like a weird baby <laughs> yeah, no, gun. No, the best part of this is, is the context. Is This is like some multi-million dollar gadget that you steal at one point in your memory. And it's like, dude, I knew kids in like their garage who could make this thing out of wood. It's just like a <laughs> snorkel little bender thing. Like, yeah. Well, the other thing is like, it seems like it does the like, is it really that worth it to like put it around a corner versus to just like lean out around a corner? This, yeah, this, like, way, so this is a real is device, it? by the way. Joe, I just, I don't know if you're I aware. Just point that out. If, if somebody shoots a gun, you don't get hurt. Are you aware of this? <laughs> what do you mean? I'm saying if you have a gun that'll go around a corner so you don't have to, the no odds of you getting shot no, are I, drastically I get, lower. I get that. I okay. guess I just mean like from a pure like gameplay mechanic standpoint, uh, really how different is it b- between just like a lean, which, you're, us- which yeah. you're usually not vulnerable during when you're playing an FPS, right? Or mm. anyway. But, but you are. Boring. Like it's just like, you know, it's, it, it is so you don't have to poke yourself out and you can still remain stealthy. Mm. One thing I want to point out in how this is kind of a mind trip is when you have that gun out early in the game, you're in a parking garage. There's, I don't know, five, six cars in one area, right? When you're looking into the the finder, the, the view screen on that gun, there are additional cars there that are obstacles that block your bullets. So there's weird things going on at that point. I don't want to spoil anything, mm. but vision-wise, your memory-wise is not lining up correctly with what's actually there in the environment and you're starting to see different things in the finder hmm. huh it's it's really it to me i i was playing it and i kept thinking of like inception like it's going really hardcore after that inception vibe of like we have to go deeper and we're messing around with uh-huh. like memories and stuff and the science here is probably crazy nonsense bullshit like there's no scientific foundation for this yeah but it's fun and that game is it's really really fun outside of some glitches and stuff like i really enjoyed my time with it it's eight to nine hours it's just it's a good time. It's a good thriller. And you I, compared it to Condemned before. Yeah, yeah, it does the Condemned. Like, the beginning of Condemned has you walking around before it becomes, like, you're just brawling pe- with people. Uh, in the beginning of Condemned, a lot of people who love that game remember that you're walking around and you're investigating, like, a crime scene with your cell phone and doing pictures, taking pictures and talking to your handler and stuff. Uh, like, the at least half of Get Even is like that. So it's yeah. not just that one segment from Condemned because that segment's only in Condemned for, like, a couple of minutes, but at least half of the game is like that segment. And that Hmm. kind of when you're in the asylum, that whole exploration sequence is like condemned, right? Like you're on edge the whole time. Maybe you run into one or two people at that point. Uh, But one thing that's just really interesting too about it is there's a lot of choice. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you will run into other people wearing the same headset as you. And they might be locked up in a cage, like Saw. Like I think it's like Condemn meets Saw meets Inception. Yeah. So they'll be Metal Gear Solid too. <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll figure out a combination using your gadget to figure out like the key code or whatever to potentially free this person. But what might happen at that point? Like, mm-hmm. are they going to turn on you? Will they help you? And then, as JV saying, I still haven't beat the game yet, but there's something long-standing that yeah, there, there, there are both immediate consequences as well as long-standing ones. Like when you mm-hmm. reach the end of the game, there is sort of, you know, a reckoning for your choices that you've made. Hmm. Like, you are held accountable. It's very cool. I like it. I have one more question about this game. It was originally supposed to come out, I think, in April Mm. or May. It was delayed because uh, in the wake of the Manchester shooting. Oh, Lord. Uh, Okay. Bombing. Oh, Oh, yeah. Sorry. There's... Sorry. Yeah. um, The the Manchester attack. So, like, do you... Does that... I guess... I don't want you to spoil anything, but, like... After playing, did that make sense? Or you're like, yes, oh yeah, that, I, that I can is, see why they delayed this. Within the first yeah. 10 minutes, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I mean, there is there is a plot. Twi- and this isn't really, you know, a spoiler necessarily because like so many of their trailers have been about this. There is there is something involving a bomb. So yeah, it makes sense. Now okay. I understand the Miller Solid 2 connection. <laughs> 9-11 and the whole cutscene. Remember yep. in New York City? Batman oh, actually shows up. You know? Oh, sounds great. Yeah. Uh, who published this thing? Uh, Bandai. Bandai, yeah. yeah. Bandai Namco. What? Yeah, an odd one out of nowhere. And mm-hmm. this one, I think, is twenty nine. I think this. Yeah, is this one's twenty nine. Twenty nine ninety nine. Hell, budget game informer show. <laughs> there yeah. we go. Let's keep going down this list. Reiner Cars three. Yeah. Uh, this <laughs> is it. A case where the development history is more interesting than the game itself, because this was the remnants of Avalanche reformed, and instead of Disney owning this thing, now it's Warner Brothers reviving. So WB reviving a former Disney studio to make a Disney game. It's strange, isn't it? Yeah, so how's the game? Uh, it's good. It's it's actually, uh, Jeff Cork and I played some of it here at work. Surprisingly challenging. Like, it, 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 it's one of those developer, or games that comes out where I think the developer 
kind of made it for themselves to you know really have fun at work and, and play in this game where it's like every race is just super intense even against ai on medium difficulty uh <laughs> but there's a lot of challenges to it and uh the racing feels good there's a lot of mechanics as well where you can race backwards you know your car is very animated on the track you could spin up on two wheels you know bump other cars out of the way it feels more alive than just a car in you know any typical racer or mario kart i would argue they are alive they're sentient beings yeah but i mean they convey that actually pretty well but a lot of challenges and they even pull from their history where um they have tracks from cars too a, a previous uh, yeah. cars game that avalanche made that they recycle in interesting ways with the new mechanics and hmm. uh yeah it's a good game it's a surprisingly good game and it's on switch playstation 4 Xbox One, and then get this: PlayStation Three and Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty. That's familiar. Oh. So Love this it. is this goes way back. Good lord. Uh, Wii U as well. Really? I believe what? so. What? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's funny. Like I remember being at the studio for Disney Infinity Three cover story trip, and uh, John Blackburn, uh, head of the studio, uh, still is now. Uh, he was talking about like just ha- the crazy impact that the first Cars video game had. They didn't develop it. I think they developed you know Cars Two, like you said. But I guess like the original Cars video game sold something crazy, like 8 million copies yeah. or more than that. Just like astronomically high. And it turns out there's an audience for Cars-specific video games or any Cars merchandise, actually. And one mm. of the smartest touches is split-screen co-op. And you could do that with the campaign. There's so a, you a, and your little son Johnny, yeah. Ben Hansen, can play. Mm, little Johnny Vignaki. I There's a part of me that kind of wants to get it for Switch and play it, even though I don't own Mario Kart on Switch yet, but... Even though I despise that movie, I still kind of want to see what a game is. Is it a really bad movie? Oh, yeah. It's the most boring Pixar movie. The most boring movie I've seen in a theater in a long time. In a theater, not a single laugh. The entire film. It is just lame. Oh, good. A a nice straight face Pixar movie is what everyone needs. (laughs) Exactly. I think they're going for jokes. I think. Uh, But boy, we talked about it last week. We don't need to complain. Uh, Okay. Okay. But... A tier below Mario Kart, obviously, but yeah. still worth playing. Like if, if you love racing games that are of you know kind of the more fun arcadey variety, it's it it definitely uh, had me entertained. So and speaking of that exact look. genre, you know, it comes out on Friday. Uh, maybe you're listening to this on Friday, but we haven't played it yet. That new Micro Machines game from Codemasters. Oh, I cannot wait. Micro Machines uh, World Series, it's called. It looks cool, man. Talk about throwbacks to yesteryear. Screw you, Crash. It was all about Micro Machines <laughs> on the NES. <laughs> Those games were brilliant. Joe, brilliant. Joe is having feelings right now. Well, my weird feelings about this is like Micro Machines as a brand is just the dumbest thing. <laughs> what? Beyond... They're tiny cars. I know. But How like, cool is that? Any cars in a video game are tiny cars. What do you mean? Like, what? Like, Explain. The only appeal of Micro Machines is the fact that they are tiny physical cars that you buy and hold and can play with. That's what made them cool. Don't that you? Is putting, still... them, putting them on the screen isn't like... Ah, oh, good. This car has the Micro Machines brand in digitized Don't you understand form. how cool... Didn't you it's play, still a car! Didn't it's you just, play Twisted Metal Small Brawl? Like, being a small thing, or like Toy Commander on Dreamcast, yeah. being a small little vehicle in is real something different. It's Why do you hate Joy? Like, I you'll be racing around like a t- kitchen table with bananas and food on it. That's yeah. awesome. Joe, I'm going to shove you into a small car. <laughs> penance for what you've said here on this show. Uh, you guys want to move on to emails? Sure. Let's do it. Great. Uh, before that, we have a quick ad. Uh, just kidding, we don't actually have ads on the Game Informer show. But, speaking of which, uh, isn't it cool that we don't? Hey, we would love it if you told a friend about this podcast. Oh. Wouldn't that be stellar? If you enjoy it, any aspect of it, outside of Joe Juba, just send a link to your friend. It would be, it would mean the world to us. Or enemies. Enemies. I would wish Ben Hansen on any enemy. Absolutely. Make a flyer with uh, bitly URLs to uh, the <laughs> iTunes feed. Put it up uh, in your neighborhood. All right, thank you for listening to this ad. Moving on. Emails. And welcome back to the Informer Show. We've some great emails from the community. People sent in their wonderful questions, comments, feedback to podcast at gameinformer.com. It's the coolest email address there is. So if there's anything you want us to talk about, any questions you have for us, podcast at gameinformer.com. A lot of great emails this week. Uh, we chose some of the best and then we're going to narrow it down to the very best as long as these three gentlemen sitting next to me and that's what you are, gentlemen. You do not forget the absolute best of the best. I'm so, picking number three. Uh, oh, that one? I don't know. Ken Pittman. We'll see how this one goes. <laughs> uh, first up, uh, 
Adam H. says, hey, here's another one for the it's nice to want things category from last week. No one lives forever one and two. Uh, yeah, or just a new No One Lives Forever. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for listening to last week's show. We listed off every game that fans could possibly want. Yeah, <laughs> don't <laughs> uh, don't give it to Vicarious Visions. Yeah. <laughs> you it's seem to be, love that game. This is my new thing. Some, this is my new thing. Trashing the studio <laughs> way to game that you thoroughly enjoyed. <laughs> cool. Stealing identities. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Mm. They're not like wearing an Andy Gavin skin suit. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Yet. Okay, all right. Uh, Mitchell from Australia says, hey, Ben, rest of the GIA staff. With the recent announcement of the Super Nintendo Classic, I was thinking about purchasing one. I'm in my early 20s, and my first gaming generation was the PS1 64, so I've never played any of the games with it. Do you mm. think I'm missing a part of gaming history without playing them, or will I struggle to get my money's worth without any nostalgia for the content? Super Nintendo Classic was announced. Uh, this is everything people wanted. And is it everything people want? Boy. So it's got, I think... A few things I reviewed the NES classic. For oh, us, great! And like a few things that I have heard about this uh, that really have me excited are like a the inclusion of a second controller is yeah. a big deal. So if you want to play like the multiplayer games on there, you don't have to like go out of your way and try and find like the NES classic is hard enough to find to actually have to like track down a second controller for it. That's nice. Also, uh, I heard that the controller cables, like the cords, are longer. They move them from like By two feet. Yeah, it's so not exactly a god. Three thing. to five, right? Right. Yeah. Five feet. I wonder how does that compare to the original length of the Super Nintendo cables? Do we know? I don't remember. Mm. But it's a little but, more reasonable. Still well, use a little leeway. It may I mean, it's you're still not gonna be able to do that like have it up on your entertainment center and you sit like right. you know way far back on your couch. But I mean Oh, you mean like a console. Right. It's yeah. I mean it's it's still it's still not like modern industry standard, but I mean really on the NES classic you felt I felt so weirdly tethered to that system just because of like the the required proximity of that stuff. Yeah, you're really not supposed bizarre. to open it. It's not <laughs> supposed to play it. It's just yeah. a collector's item. It's yeah. very clear now. Uh, so before, from a practical standpoint, I think those are I think those are big improvements. Yeah, and the games list. We're going to run down everything, uh, and we'll eventually get to Mitchell's question here. Yeah. But Final Fantasy Three is great to have on there. Mm-hmm. Earthbound is great to have on there. Star Fox One. Game called Star Fox 2 on there. Uh, what other standouts did you guys F-Zero, have? F-Zero, Super Metroid, of course. Super Punch-Out, Link, Super oh, Mario World, the Link Yoshi's the Island, yeah. Final Fantasy 3. Right, right. right. It's Not 6. six. It's yeah. six. Like I was looking down that list and the only thing I saw that was honestly missing was uh, Chrono Trigger. It yeah. is odd, isn't it? Like they have Secret of Man on there and like Final, what, what is it? Final okay. Fantasy 4 or 3? Three? Three. It's, it's, I just said it. It's yeah. 6. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear you. But like, <laughs> we've all said it several times in different ways. On there is weird to me. It is, yeah. it is odd. I saw some conspiracy theorists online being like, oh, maybe it means that Square has other plans for Chrono Trigger, maybe some sort of re release thing. Mm. Uh, I think that's reading too far into it. You got to yeah. draw the line somewhere. Weird, they wouldn't choose the greatest RPG of all time, but pff, each their own. No, they did. Oh, they did. I'll be damned. I don't know if you heard Final Fantasy 3 slash 6 is on there. Oh, they're just talking about Contra Alien Wars. <laughs> no, guys, you can't play Skyrim on this. Uh, uh, so to Mitchell's question specifically, though, not uh, yet. You should still pick this up, even if you start with the generation like that. I didn't have any nostalgia for those games. I played a lot of them in high school, and so many of them hold up so much better than that garbage on the NES. Like this is where games got good, Super Nintendo. Uh, th- there's going to be a ton to enjoy on there. You know what? Oh yeah, right. This industry, we're so obsessed with the past and just reliving memories and like play new games. Seriously. Is this a, is this a bit? <laughs> Seriously. No, seriously. Like <laughs> we're it's always about bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. You don't do that with movies and you're not going back and watch Charlie Chaplin and sure, Abbott people and do that with movies. Yeah. Some. But they but want But this is like, like people, every gamer, it's like a rite of passage like, "Oh, you haven't played Final Fantasy." But don't you III? want Charlie Chaplin's movies on Blu-ray? No. Some people it's do. It's over. <laughs> it's over, Charlie. No. But see, my my issue with it is like I'm sure that's fine, and it's a good collector's item and stuff, but honestly, after buying a Switch, I'd rather just buy those games piecemeal totally. on my Switch, really just to too. like, oh, I want to play Link to the Past and Super Metroid, yeah. and uh, basically any of those games that I'm interested in, you know, f- you know, buying them individually instead of like dropping, what is it, $80, $90 on this? 80 Yeah, 80. for something that I have to have tethered to my screen in my <laughs> living room. Like, and I get it. I get people, you know, who are into that and like not even necessarily a nostalgia factor. Like, hey, maybe you want to play the game with the original controller. Super necessary. Yeah. But like for me, I don't know. Just let me play these games on the go. Is that a joke? Super necessary? That was my joke, Joe. Anyways, it is. It is such a slap in the face to a degree of people that bought Switch and it's like there's 
Neo Geo, Neo Geo games on there, <laughs> but no virtual console yet. Yet yeah, you're putting all that stuff on these systems. Okay. Yeah. So spe- I, I mean, addressing the question specifically, like I, oh. I, I also agree that like this is not the the ideal way for Nintendo li- to give people access to these games. It's a cool but novelty if you want. It. Considering this is a way that they are putting out there, like. I can't div- I can't like separate myself from the nostalgia that I have for this. The Super Nintendo is my favorite console. So it's like I can't be objective about it. But I think that some of the games that are included in there of the like 21 are like straight up like just some of the best games ever made. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh yeah. And they are from an era. I mean, we were talking about PS1 before and how sometimes that doesn't age well. Like 16-bit games age well. They still play mm-hmm. well. The, like they don't hurt your eyes to look at. And like, <laughs> yeah, like the, the pixels work. It yeah. is an, it is an era that is easy to go back to. And like, I've, I've gone back and replayed a lot of those games in the last, you know, several years. And I'd argue we've super replayed a lot of those games. Yeah, 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 for sure. And like, they are still good. They are still fun. I don't think that it's like, I don't think it's like going back and trying to watch Charlie Chaplin where you're, where you really have to have a sort of like primordial appreciation for what it is. You know? uh, to defend Mr. Chaplin, no, I no, still no, think no. those I'm... movies hold up very, very well. Okay, great. Better than a lot of any escort but, bitch, but yes. That's, I don't know, that's my point. It's 80 bucks, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Are you're you twenty one. You're not interested. Ah, just buy Overwatch loot boxes. I don't know. Just do something. No, I think there is. This, no. is, this is a bit now. This has got to be. <laughs> no, I think I, I don't want any of you guys. I want to a go little to the bit store. less over there. I, I do think there's value in it for people who are into that sort of thing. Like maybe people who aren't necessarily even hardcore gamers. You know, they're just like, hey, you know, let's play this from time to time. Who don't have a console all the time, so especially if like they're not interested in modern consoles. Yeah. yeah one no. thing I'll say, a lot of people that. Bought the NES Classic that I've talked to, were bored of it after like 30, 40 minutes, right? Like they were like, eh, I get the hook, but I'm not going to play these games. These games on the Super Nintendo Classic, you will want to play yep. through to they the end. They are better games. They are way better games. So much better. Uh, it really kind of shows where the medium went in terms of storytelling and just, you know, evolution of action as well. Yeah. So I think it is a better deal than the NES Classic, just in the entertainment you're going to get from it. Uh, but again, I agree. Like the day this hits, these games should be on the switch as well. Yeah. 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 One more statement about this too. Like he said, like, do I need to play this for the historical significance or something? And I think like, I think that's a level of like, like, I don't like being a a video game gatekeeper, you know, that like, well, in order to consider yourself a gamer, you really need to have a thorough understanding and appreciate like, like. If you are, that's the argument I hate. Like, yeah. I do not want people to feel like they're backed into a corner where they have to play yeah. all these games to like understand a series. Yeah. That's not. You do not have to play this to call yourself a gamer by any stretch. Oh. But like, if you if you are just interested in the hobby and you are interested in its history, I think this is a great avenue to explore. That. Right. Like it that's might good way deepen it, yeah. your appreciation. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not like a necessity. You had a tweet this morning, Joe, about how you're worried about. <laughs> Even oh, if God. you wanted one of these, just yeah, just fantasizing about how impossible it is going to be to pick one of these up because Nintendo's made it clear again. This is like another limited run. They say that they're going to pump out more than classic, but coming from Nintendo, I don't know if I can mean and take that to mean that I can actually get my hands on one of these dumb yeah. things. They didn't do pre-orders on the last one, did they? Like it was just a you got to be there. Yeah, I think they did. I, I, uh, I don't think maybe they just people weren't paying attention as much because they didn't know how crazy it was going to get. Here's my other concern: is like I've seen people say, like, "Look, Nintendo's like fixing it with the Switch too. Like they're working on supply problems there." But it's like they have a vested interest in keeping the Switch successful from like yes. you know like from now going forward. Yes. Their actions with the NES class, just like the abrupt discontinuation of that when there was still clearly a high demand for it, I think demonstrates that like they they are not super interested in making sure that everyone who wants one of these can get it. They even said like in the official statement saying like this is gonna be a limited run, then we're gonna, you know, continue to focus on the switch. So it seems very much like, okay, well look, we'll pacify fans and then we're getting back to the meat of it because that is yeah. clearly where and it makes sense business wise. And that's what like that's what scares me about it. It's like like I like I didn't worry about the switch. I didn't get a switch until like a month and a half after it had come out because yeah. I wanted to, you know, I just waited until it was a little easier to to get. Like, I don't think you'll be able to do that because if you wait too long and this is just going to miss your window completely. So it's like, I hate that. It's a better machine. People are going to freak out more because they missed out on the first one. I think the demand's going to be higher just for those two things. It's going to be a a zoo out there. Like, especially if they don't have pre-orders for this. I mean, there's pre-orders in the UK that sold out immediately for this one. Yeah. Nothing here in the States yet. I have a bunch of notifications set like, email me when this becomes available on Various retailers. <laughs> Light my pants on so, fire. Yeah. But yeah. Joe, don't worry. I told people not to get it. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. Don't the buy word this. has been spread. Uh, okay. You will not enjoy it. The games are bad. Aaron Bivens has a related question. Hello, GI and crew. With the Super Nintendo Mini finally being announced, it got me wondering, just how far will these remake consoles go? Will we see a Mini N64, Mini GameCube? Also, will other companies try to bandwagon on this to see if they to see how well the Mini Super Nintendo does? Uh, what would your guys' dream Mini console be? Uh, I feel like other companies are like they already had like package Genesis things that already exists in a couple different forms. Well, but now they're, the they rumored. just announced there's Atari's back. They're doing something called hmm. rumored Atari box, which has to be like a everybody's thinking an Atari 2600, right? Like, but they've already cranked out like those Atari classic plug and play. Things. Yeah, but this is like kind of latching onto Nintendo's success, right? Like, yeah, doing yeah. it up as a collector's item, I bet. Hmm. I feel like Atari's also done that before too. Like I feel like they've Atari's already done plug and play collections. They've done everything they can. But what about just Nintendo specifically? Do you think a mini N sixty four is reasonable within the next three years? Yes. I don't I, I think they're We've stopping. Seen, here. I think we're gonna see all the way up to Wii. So I think we're gonna see next year the N sixty four classic with enhanced next visuals. Year. Yes. With enhanced visuals like uh the GameCube version of Zelda. Uh, when they did that, remember when they brought the N64 Ocarina mm. of Time on the disc? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I think we'll see the GameCube after that. And then Mini that's GameCube. It. How small How will those discs have to be? be? <laughs> Just picture the little box. I think, we. you know what? I I would bet that we would see like a second edition of the, of the 16-bit era with a new collection of I games we before too. we would see an N64. I'm Wait, Joe. I'm going to go back on this. Great. Next year, we're going to see maybe a Game Boy. A that's portable. that's a possibility. Doing like a like a GBA collection, or just I didn't a straight even up game that. Yeah. yeah, they could do any that's of those. That's really handles. smart. So they actually. could stretch this out for like five or six years. Yeah, they but never have to release they, Virtual Console. It'll why would they stop at N sixty four? You know, like just because it's a little different. It's not sprite based. I, emulation gets harder. Uh, you but know. I mean, <laughs> why stop there when the, these are just printing money? But I guess they don't care about money because they could sell a billion more of these and they're not. Granted, the N64 was never my console, but man, I cannot think of a list of 20 N64 games that I would be like, oh yeah, look at all these great games. I, I think it would go a play. little Bumble. bit something like this. All right, we got uh, GoldenEye Perfect Dark. We got Banjo-Kazooie, Mario 64, Pilot Wings, if you want to be a weirdo. Huh? Uh, we got Wave Race. We have... Blast Core. Sure, let's put Blast Core on there. Uh, Space Station Silicon Valley. Oh. Let's throw that on there. How about Glover? Let's throw that crap let's on Pokemon there. Let's Pokemon Stadium <laughs> 1 and 2. Let's put Glover on there. Let's put Pokemon <laughs> Snap on there. Ocarina Majora's. Ocarina Majora's. Eh. All right, who can forget? Games. Uh, did, did I mention Paper Mario? Paper Mario. Um, All right, I'll throw Paper Mario on there to? as well. What are you up to, 15? 15. Smash Brothers. Of course. Oh, Jesus Christ. All right, we boom. got Smash Brothers. I mean, there's so many other Donkey ones. Donkey Kong Country or Donkey nope. Kong 64? 64. Sure. You throw know it what? It's the mercy. People throw, won't like but, it, but yep. put it on there. All right, we need three more. Crickets. Hang on. That's not a real game. Oh, um, there's uh, Mortal Kombat uh, Sub-Zero Mythologies. Uh, <laughs> Star, Fox Star Fox 64 and Turok. Yeah, Turok. There's 20, Joe. Boom. Uh, Sit down before you fall down. Yeah, <laughs> you really showed me. <laughs> I, we I'd did really... give Glover one of those spots, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I'd really like a portable Dreamcast. I want that. That would be a funky little set. That, I want that to get a second chance. They've pumped out so many of those fake Genesises. You know, Sega has like a mini Dreamcast. That, I, I feel, feel like that could get Super Nintendo, well, not quite Super Nintendo levels of buzz, but maybe. Because that GameCube level console just had so many w games that were just playing out weird. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just like so many bad but interesting survival horror games. And you're into weird, bad, interesting yes. games? Huh. Uh, we're huh. talking about Get Even. Yes. Uh, I'll be damned. Uh, I, it's, it's Eternal too, Darkness. That was GameCube. That was GameCube. Oh, yeah. The first time I saw that was N64. Actually. Or oh. Xbox 360. They could. Oh, wait, like no, no, Star no, no, Fox no, no. That's 2. That's Perfect Dark. Like Star Fox 2, they could release the original versions of some of those N64 games. Oh, related. Cameo? And we could get a mini PS1 and then we could get that original PS1 version of Eco and see what that was like. Oh. I, I would like a mini PS1. Let's do it. That'd be cool. Uh, that's, a, that's a real sweet but spot. Let's keep making these. But like the, the small PS1 is already like this tiny. Oh, the yeah. PS1? Yeah. Make it smaller. <laughs> You'd have to go box. with a keychain. Do you yeah. want a keychain that you can take? Make oh, it a awesome. microchip. Is it too in much In your to brain. Ask? Keep making these. Like I said earlier, all we want are old games. Oh boy. Ken Pittman says, hey, G.I. Joe's, Crews, Cobra Commanders. Hello. With Hello. the announcement of the Super Nintendo Classic, also came the announcement of Star Fox 2 finally being released, which is truly something special. I agree. 
Uh, the murkiness over legal rights to the FX trip uh, has been a thing for years and mm. released on Wii and DS. Uh, and also a re-release of the Super Nintendo Yoshi's Island has been prevented for years due to an Argonaut Games being defunct uh, who helped work on the FX chip. Yeah. Did Nintendo make a brand new version of the Super FX chip that they fully own or perhaps they spent time remaking the game so it could be done purely digital like Mario 64 DS? Uh, do you have any insight into how this happened? Because it is amazing that Yoshi's Island is also in that batch because yeah. uh, it's never really been re-released in that original Super Nintendo state. Hmm. What about... It- Star Fox and Virtual Console. Was that a thing? I think Star Fox 1 was. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that was FX chip. So yeah, they figured out some workaround around it. I yeah. guess. Yeah. Because Argonaut, yeah, they made Croc and all those games and they were gone long ago. Yeah, it's confusing. Uh, Dylan Cuthbert was on the podcast years ago now at this point talking about Star Fox 2 and how Miyamoto wanted to get it out there eventually. Hey, there it is. That's sweet. But yeah. Ken has a follow-up question. Uh, what game that is currently technically or legally infeasible to be re-released on a modern system that you want a company to go out of the way to fix and give you. Uh, personally, I want Sega to re-release their Star Wars trilogy arcade on console, even if it meant I had to use a PS Move or Joy-Con to replicate the joystick. What do you guys want? That's impossible. I mean, we already talked about this earlier, but no one lives forever and no oh, one wow. lives forever too, because when I went and talked to the Night Dive folks for that System Shock piece that we yeah. ran, it was so sad because Steven, who owns the company, went to his garage and on the left side, sad. they were like really, they were really close to actually like getting that out there as one of their first games. Hmm. No one lives forever. Wow. Uh, and they had posters for it, like just tons and tons of posters. And he said, "Hey, do you want one? Because you know we're not, we don't do anything with these because we printed up all of these expecting to hear back from Fox that it, we had, you know, the the green light, and they didn't. And so it just Fox said, owns it. Uh, th- there's like a dispute. Like oh, there's boy. a dispute with like three companies over like that IP." So, like, just I think it's because I saw like how crushed he was. Yeah. <laughs> when he gave when he gave us that poster, I was like, "Oh, I'm so sorry." But No One Lives Forever is a really good game, so I'd love to see that somehow emerge into the light again. Yeah, for sure. Because it's a pain to get run. You have to download like five patches on modern systems to like even get it to run. Maybe I'm crazy here. Maybe it's already been done. But Space War. They keep talking about like that's one of the first games ever ran mm. on this crazy supercomputer. Is that playable anywhere? What a like, weird question. Yeah, like that's something like as like going back to the Charlie Chaplin thing. Like this is the first official big game like that was made, right? Like I'd love to see that, or at least just try it. That'd be uh, like separate home box. Just release a Space War console. That'd and you be can cool. Plug it in. Yeah. Just- Check it out. Hmm. Reiner, I cannot track your logic throughout this episode. <laughs> it's really a roller coaster. <laughs> uh, I would love just to have frequency and amplitude playable uh, on. HDTVs. That's doable though. Yeah, but there's always you, there's crazy delay when you're hooking up to a modern TV and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and even like musically, uh, the rights might be good. That's true. Yeah, that whatnot. could be that mm. could be a tough one actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually that throws into a, a kink into it because I'd like to have a version of Grand Theft Auto Vice City that's playable on modern systems that still has the original soundtrack because they've changed that soundtrack like twice because yeah. of music rights. Yeah. yeah. It'll just be muted like videos on YouTube. Well, you saw what happened to Alan Wake. Like, Yeah, Alan Wake's gone forever. Because of the music. Yeah. Like, they didn't have the license long enough. Never would, include music in your game. Would PT count on this? Mm. On this Ooh. Maybe. Yeah, of course. Mm. Reiner, you have that on your console still, right? No. no. I have it on mine. Hang on, Reiner, did you delete it? No, I never had it. No, you totally did. Because oh, I yeah, actually yeah, deleted yeah. mine. Yeah, we have, you... yes, we have PT. Yes, okay. absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Okay, great. We need to have like a special PS4 in the vault to keep it and just label it the PT this, PS4. This PS4 has PT. Do not touch. <laughs> Do not breathe on. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was confusing it with PN03. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I think I think that thing's doable. Oh my uh, God, that POS? <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> Nate says, with the cancellation of any more single-player DLC for Andromeda, do you think the Mass Effect series is dead? Will they bring it back, or is it Anthem in the future? Joe, I asked you about this this morning. Yeah. Uh, because I was under the assumption that they're making DLC for Andromeda, but you informed me they never announced that. Yeah, I... I so, so you, you looked that up, that's for sure? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, Hanson asked me about this, and I and I was like, you know, I actually don't remember any concrete announcement that they are for sure going to do DLC. That's insane. Um, so all they had, and all the sites uh, are just running with like teases of Corian DLC. Uh, in some sort of multiplayer update, they had a tease of like, oh, we're trying to bring the arc to Andromeda. We're almost there. Maybe we'll see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but apparently, the Corian arc crashed into a moon, and <laughs> everyone's dead, <laughs> and no one's coming. 
and uh, there's no hope. Yeah, I mean, that, like, I think that there is there is room there to te- to like do some interesting stuff. But like, I wonder about the quarry and arc stuff. I wonder if that's like DLC material or if that's like comic book or novel. M- like one of those is much cheaper yeah and they probably need some bodies to work on anthem at that point yeah yeah but and as a whole i don't think mass effect as a series is dead i think that they definitely need to let it um well i would like more of it i know that jv especially is uh on on the other side of this no no i disagree um, completely i want more of it i just don't want more andromeda yeah Yeah. i think that initiative is done Uh, i would i would guess that that whole expedition we saw the end of it and might just, read about it like yeah, Joe's saying, I, but yeah. I would, I personally would like, would like more Andromeda, but just done better. God, uh, but just think about like I, letting that series cool off, reform that, that would probably take years. And then the idea of ramping up production on a whole new Mass Effect game also yeah. years. So it could be a long time. Yeah, they I'm were, fine with that. Do it right or don't do it at all. Yeah. I yeah, mean, I they think, were weird talking about it out of the gates, right? Like, People were wondering if it was a trilogy, but they never like committed. Like, yeah, they said they're. It was very strange. Yeah. So at this point too, I think it's I think an interesting thing to look at with uh, Bioware and their pattern when dealing with things that are don't go the way they want is like if you look at Dragon Age Two, which came out uh, really close on the heels. Like I think eighteen months after the orig- of, after Dragon Age Origins, oh, really? okay. so it came out super fast and was not was not met with the, I mean, kind of like Andromeda actually, like w- was sort of met with like the disappointment of like, this is not what I signed up for here. Yep. Um, and then with Inquisition, they like let that, they let that franchise sleep for years and waited until like they really found an identity for it again. But at least in theory, there was still like that core Dragon Age team. It's not like the creative leads went on to other projects where I feel like in this case, they probably are going to move on to other projects other than Mass Effect, not just keep it in a low idle for a while. But who knows? Yeah, no, I, I I think that's probably true. If anything, what I would want to see next from them on the Mass Effect front is that, like, you know, the the thing so many fans want, and Bioware's never given any firm indication that we're ever going to get, and that's the like not just like a collection of the trilogy, but sort of a version of it that is consistent across the entries in terms really of like cool. gameplay and progression. I thought you were going to say a Telltale series, but no, oh. it's around. Uh, let's see. Jason from Monroe, Michigan says, Hey crew, just read the last issue and love the story about gamers with disabilities. Being a disabled gamer myself that made me smile. I have cerebral palsy and only good use of my right hand. I enjoy playing sports games in Destiny. Also enjoy the Destiny 2 article. Can't wait for the beta on July 18th. Love the show. Jay, you wrote that. Yeah. yeah. He enjoyed nice that. There you go. Yeah, thanks. Um, let's see. Jason Andrian writes in, is wondering if we've ever seen the game Kingdom Come Deliverance. Mm-hmm. Apparently it's coming in 2018. We have a preview in the next issue about yeah, it. Yeah, Kyle was really impressed with that demo. Uh, but I guess his concerns were, can they land this? Like, it seems super ambitious. It's going for, uh, I didn't know this. He actually informed me. I haven't read the preview yet. Uh, but Jason says it looks like a Skyrim Witcher type game without magic. Yeah, God. See, That's, Kyle, Kyle said it's super ambitious, like really, really ambitious, over the top, crazy. Kingdom Come colon Deliverance. Yeah, it's, yeah. so its scope, like like Reiner's saying, like ambition wise, its scope is just huge. But like, it also does not sound super. F- like it does not sound super fun to me because it's got it's not just like oh it's a world without magic. It's a world that's like hyper focused on realism. So it's like you want like living the life of just like a a medieval peasant is not oh does not sound great. It's like to Star me. Wars Galaxies, it sounds great. Oh, man. I I think it could be interesting. It. it depends on how it's handled. Like Pathologic is sort of that game that's hyper focused on like realism and disease and stuff, and you're not really powerful in that game, but it's still interesting and fun. And you have people who are like into stalker and arma and stuff. Yeah, as long as it's weird and interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sure. That's, that's my <laughs> uh, let's see. Larry from South Australia. Hey, Ben. I keep meaning to ask, how do you produce the GI show? I always assume the video angles are being switched in real time in the booth and then only minor editing happens later. And is there any audio compression being applied to the microphones during or after recording? I uh, hope it's not too geeky for a question. Uh, no, we're geeks here. Uh, yeah, it is switched in real time by Leo Vader, uh, Leo Vader uh, video editor in the booth uh, over there uh, with a broadcast picks. Uh, we have all the cameras running into it. And then we do compress the audio uh, during the show and then also run it uh, through some crazy compression later uh, before we pump it out. And also, actually, if you want to get really technical, I rip the audio version of the show from the video version of the show. And every once in a while, I can hear a little hiccup or a little skip. If that has ever driven you insane, 
please email and let me know and then I can shake it up and actually construct a separate audio version of the show. Uh, but that's the core of it. It's then captured in OBS. Anyways, um, Mal from Mississippi, if you could be a comic relief sidekick to your favorite video game character, who would it be? I think it'd be a lot of fun to follow Solid Snake around carrying his comically large supply of weapons and pointing out that most of what is going on does not make any sense. Keep up the good work. <laughs> That's not comic relief. That's just a buzzkill. <laughs> Solid snake simulation. Boo. <laughs> Makes sense. Put on <laughs> pants. I would love to be Gordon Freeman's sidekick, trying to get him to talk and smile. Oh, trying to crack him up, like yeah. tickling him while he's <laughs> trying to shoot head crabs? <laughs> Laugh. This is a <laughs> joke. Come on. Laugh it up all you can. You don't got long to live here, Gordon. Look how stupid Go. these head crabs look. <laughs> I think hmm. uh, I would just like to also just laugh at uh, Kratos. Uh, I just <laughs> that, you would I, laugh once. Uh, well, no, no. I, I, I'm like a I look. If I get to choose my comic relief character, I'd be like a weird figment, just some weird uh, like fog that would just mock him because it, it, someone needs to just tell him to cool it a little bit every <laughs> once in a while. Hmm. Uh, I'd follow Sonic and just like push him into pits and stuff like that on the spikes, oh. and then I'd laugh at it. Yeah, mm. that's a good. Yeah, that's a good one. Screw that guy. I don't know. <laughs> I would, I think it would be like Nathan Drake for me. I'd like to be part of like being Uncharted just because like he I, is funny. He's already funny. I guess he doesn't need more comic relief, but like, I don't know. They seem like they'd be cool dudes to hang out with. <laughs> yeah, you're so be a terrible, a unfunny third wheel. Yeah, yeah. I was like, hey, <laughs> hey, dude, you just murdered 700 people. How are you feeling? I'd be another buzzkill though. Joke? It'd be like, it'd be like, all right, I think I can make it. Whoa, that jump is super dangerous, buddy. Don't no, you're gonna get hurt. You're gonna get hurt. Just let, let's call for help. <laughs> uh, Keegan from LA. Uh, hello, Ben and GI crew. I was thinking about, uh, I was thinking with the recent announcement of the remake of Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, how weird the ambassador program was for the 3DS. 10 different GBA games were released and were exclusive to this program, and they never released the GBA games with that tech, and that was five and a half years ago. Isn't it strange they never released them anywhere else? Would you guys have played any GBA games on your 3DS if they offered them? Yeah, it's worth reflecting on that. Remember that time when the 3DS yeah. was tanking and then Nintendo's like, here's a bunch of games. Uh, it's exclusive to the ambassador program, maybe sort of. And it's like, okay, cool. I can't wait three months from now until they release these elsewhere. Yeah. And then they didn't. They never Nowhere. did. Nowhere. Someone forgot about that. <laughs> it's insane. They could make so much money off those. I hey, love having more aware on that. my 3DS at all times. Nintendo yeah. doesn't like money. It's I'm trying fun. to remember standout games from Game Boy Advance that weren't like Mario and Luigi. Mar uh, Metroid Fusion, Metroid Oh, yeah, that's right. Those games. Yeah. Those All I remember games. is like the crappy Harry Potter uh, tie-in that was released that was exclusive to GBA. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Golden Sun? <sighs> GBA? Golden Sun was good. Of course. Uh, uh, Final Fantasy 4 and 6 Advanced, versions. Advance Wars. Advanced mm -hmm. versions were very good. Oh, Advance oh, Wars. Yeah, that's Advanced right. Wars. There we go. Yeah. On behalf of Serial, yeah. I'll throw that in there because apparently he thinks about that game every day. It was so said. good. Anytime I talk to Serial about Fire Emblem, I just see his face fall a little bit. <laughs> it's like that series killed Advanced Wars. <laughs> well, Battalion Wars killed Advanced Wars. No, that's, yeah. that's what Serial thinks. <laughs> oh, who was it? There was somebody that's working on Hellblade Sinuous Sacrifice that worked on Battalion Wars. Uh, it was fun to talk to them. And they said that they pitched it as something else and then went to Nintendo and it was like, oh, you want just the Advance Wars license for this? I was like, Bleh. yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's an option. Good Lord. It's like uh, we had Monster Games here in Minnesota, developer of racing games and they did that truck game that was Excite like, trucks. trucks. It's yeah. like, hey, we're going to do this truck racing game. You want the Excite bike license. <laughs> no, we're doing trucks. Yeah. Excite, Excite truck. trucks. <laughs> we would do it, but there's no you know, seamless way to meld those two words together. Ah, it'll be fine. Just cram them. <laughs> yeah. We're going to do this sports game with the ball. Metroid. <laughs> <laughs> Rob the Butcher has an interesting theory. He's under the impression that every 10 issues of the magazine, we do something special. Like the uh, like top 100 RPGs was mm -hmm. the 290th issue. Uh, he mentions the 200th issue of the magazine. We did top 200 characters of all time. Issue 250 was 30 characters who defined a decade. There's no logic to that. That's just a coincidence, right, Renner? Uh, outside of the big hundreds. Right. Yeah. Uh, or the anniversary, like 25 years, stuff like that. If we ever, we never did anything, but we thought about those things. We right? thought about like, it really hard. Uh, uh, but but he, he, yeah. he's leading into that. He says, uh, can you give us a teensy weensy hint at what you guys might have planned for the April 2018 300th issue yeah. of Game Informer? Uh no, I can't yet. Well, it's the, ap <laughs> it's the April issue. So it's, it's all just, April Fool's. It's all Game yeah. Informer. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, it's up in the air. Is we are talking about it. I could say that. Like, we've had a couple discussions about what we want to do. I don't want to tip my hat either way, like, kind of tip the what scale if, of what we're doing. What if but, we have an okay plan, but then there's, like, this crazy game reveal that's like, hey, do you want to reveal this on the cover? I mean, would we forego the 300th issue special thing for a game ever? That's a tough one. Like, that's what happened with 25, kind of, right? Where... Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a tough one, because that is such a huge, huge milestone. Uh, oh, wow. But if there's Grand Theft Auto 6 or something sitting there, it's like, right. got to do Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. yeah. So expect Grand Theft Auto 6 uh, in April 2018. <laughs> uh, anyways, pre-order it. Pre-order. Tom Awesome from Roseville, Minnesota says, Hello, Game Informers. If you can ensure there were no mailings or other violence, uh, what would be the coolest office pet Game Informer could bring in? Maybe a Liger, he says. Mauling, I think, is what he's yeah. trying to say. Okay. I mean, it's Barnaby, right, guys? Totally Barnaby. Barnaby That's is Andy the coolest. Andy McNamara's dog that we're legally obligated to say <laughs> yeah, is super Barnaby. cool. <laughs> that dog's not cool. <laughs> what are you doing, dude? dude it, it, it's funny. Care. It's funny that you said mailings because I was, uh, I was thinking like it'd be, it'd be cool to have in total like '80s movie style to have like one of those kind of like male robots that just sort of went around M A L M A I L robots. Except instead of delivering mail, you could just sort of like deliver various prank items to people in the office like hey you know give this give this rotten egg to shay well i wasn't on board until you said that yeah yeah i'm here yeah. here's Leave. a spear smeared with elephant dung <laughs> that's hansen go <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> so andy's dog joe's dog they show up at the office um, i don't know once a month twice a month something like that right mm -hmm. uh but we did have two live-in pets uh, in the history of Game Informer, there was a dog named Arthur who was a rescue dog that they found. Andy and uh, Paul Bergeron found up in a cabin up in the woods in Minnesota, hmm. uh, covered in ticks. So they named him Arthur, the tick sidekick. Oh, that's uh, very cute. That's, that's uh, very clever. Good. But he, yeah, he lived with us at the office and Paul for, I don't know, a good six, seven years. Just the nicest dog. Wow. I mean, it was on the brink, the brink of death and they brought him back. It was a really cool story. And, and the then, other pet is Jeff Korg. It's yeah. <laughs> pretty good. Uh, no, Justin Leeper had a scorpion. Oh, no, God. That he kept on his desk right behind where I sat. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. Um, and it got out of its cage and hasn't been found to this day. Is that right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, its name was Pucho. <laughs> Didn't he get mad at you for tapping on its cage I one? tapped on its cage <laughs> just playfully like, hey. Uh -huh. And he punched me in the arm as hard as he could. <laughs> and this was like a guy that was like wrestling, like trying to become a professional wrestler. It hurt. It still hurts today. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. So those are the two, two pets, Scorpion and uh, a dog. I was what? Like, what was your hiring process like for all these weirdos? I didn't care. He's also the guy that we're talking about. <laughs> it's still the same apparently. <laughs> I don't have a Scorpion. Uh, Just like, wasn't he also the guy who did the nunchuck tricks in front of Itagaki? Yeah. That's very funny. Yeah. Uh, a Turtle Rock has an mm -hmm. office uh, bearded dragon. That's a cool. Oh, one. They are I'm cool. a lizard That's fan. That'd pretty be pretty cool. That'd be cool, and just to have in the corner. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty nice. My yeah, girlfriend so has one, and they're really cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, you, I still like the prank unique. bot. Something unique, like a prank bot, unique. Yeah, I don't know what what what's a strange pet you could get, like a parrot or like one of those oh. big piranha. Piranha would be Ooh, neat. Ooh, that would be cool. Ah, the fish. You gotta clean that cage. But I mean, we can't even take care of our kitchen or bathroom. Like, <laughs> yeah, that thing would be doomed. But if we put the death robot in there, it could clean it for <laughs> us. Or maybe we can get some sort of abyssal horror, like some sort of Lovecraftian pet that could just sort of haunt no, us. No, no, no. That's Dan Tack. Oh, yeah. Anybody else want to insult uh, while we're on these mics? Hmm. JV sucks. Yeah, Joe, ah, well, I mean, that's fact. Okay. Like we we all know that. Uh, what do you guys like for email of the week? I like the SNES one. Yeah, I like that one a lot. That. Wait, wasn't that actually the third one? That what? was the first one. Oh, okay. mm, no, no, was... which one? Well, actually, technically, the third one is kind of where I'm leaning, which was the how far does this mini trend go, and what would we like to? Oh see? yeah, I like that one. Yeah, that's what we were talking about. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah where we did that, that list but... of the games, and we talked about Dreamcast, all that stuff. Yeah, but... I, I would give it to Aaron Bivens here with that question. And unfortunately, he says, "P.S. Ben play Dark Souls 2 with Dan Tack," and that's just not going to happen. So. <laughs> I know because Dark Souls 2 is the worst. <laughs> right. So, so technically, we can't. No, let's still give it to Aaron, right? Oh, yeah. Interesting. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Great question, Aaron. We love you. Thanks for writing in, everybody. Uh, and for now, stay tuned for an interview with uh, an arcade legend Eugene Jarvis so stay tuned for that
Gene Jarvis, welcome to the Game Former Show, sir. Hey, how you doing? Really good. Holding your phone in a hotel room? Where are you at, man? I mean, I'm in Helsinki, so I'm at uh, the launch party is tomorrow for uh, Next Machina. So, you know, we had a had a few bit had, had a few too many vodkas tonight, but I'm still I'm still hanging in there. All right, but that's perfect. So yeah, you've been working <laughs> with Housemark on this Next Machina game. Uh, what's yeah. this period of your life been like? Is it uh, more interesting than average times, or is this just your life? You know, I, I mean, it's it's kind of a new thing for me because I've been doing the arcade thing for like decades, you know, and uh, so working with kind of state of the art, uh, although retro gaming, but state of the art tech and PS4 console and stuff, it's kind of a new thing, and it's kind of opened a whole new world to me. Well, how detailed are you getting? Like, what are those, you know, design meetings like with Housemark and you? Um, you know, basically, uh, I mean, we, we, the heavy lifting was done uh, a couple of years ago. I mean, we uh, this game has been going on for three and a half years. Jesus. And, I, <laughs> and uh, you know, it started out at uh, Dice Conference. Uh, you know, we we're just kind of hanging out at at uh, in Vegas, and I guess you know they say. What goes in Vegas stays in Vegas, but somehow this got out of Vegas. So I don't know if that's a good thing or not. But uh, uh, we've been we've been you know trying to do this you know the ultimate the ultimate retro bullet hell twin shooter you know apocalyptic uh, scenario. So we'll see we'll see how it happens. Well, it seems like people are digging it so far. Hey Eugene, I wonder. Yes. I think your thumb's covering up the camera a little bit. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Uh, oh, oh, there, there we go. Any other way to hold it. Yeah. You got it, man. Our audio okay. listeners will love it. Little tech, little tech thing here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, Housemark wants to wants to pick the brain of a of a game industry legend. Uh, what do you get out of the experience? What were you hoping to accomplish with Next Machina? You know, it's just it's just you know, kind of get into this world of uh, console gaming, and I guess we're on Steam too, and um, you know, just you know, hang out with some young kids that are crazy and uh, have some fresh ideas uh you know kind of get some of the the cool old school stuff going but put a whole new spin on it you know and um i think that the tech they've brought to this game is it's pretty awesome i mean there's there's i guess over 1000 different shader programs running in this game i mean the 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 particles the plasma beams i mean it's it voxels i mean it's pretty amazing tech for uh for twin stick twin stick shooter <laughs> yeah it's wild man so working yeah. with uh you know people at housemark who i think yeah. they've expressed they're huge fans of your work from the past do you learn anything new from working with fanboys like that anything you have learned to appreciate about your own work you know i think you you get a new perspective on things and uh you know it's funny you can get kind of jaded over the years uh you know, you see the same thing over and over. And to you, you know, to you, things are are, are old hat. But it, it really, I think it shows, they have shown, you know, with the energy and, and fresh ideas they brought um, to this whole, you know, spiritual successor to Robotron or whatever you want to call it. I mean, I, th I think there's been some great twin chick shooters over the year. I mean, one re recent one was, uh, you know, Gravity War, I mean, Geometry Wars. And, uh, you know, I think it's it's just the genre is there's just something really cool about that genre, just complete overload. Uh, some people call it bullet hell. Um, but just having, you know, masses of enemies, all just pure gameplay um, and, uh, you know, great strategy levels, traps, um, secret mission, secret rooms you know, boss monsters. I mean, it's, it's just cool stuff. And I, I think, uh, they've really taken it, you know, from the 1990s or 2000s. Now they're in, you know, we're in the 2017. So it's, it's, it's cool to just see the, uh, a fresh crew of incredible guys take a hack at this thing. Yeah. And what do they think they get out of uh, working with you outside of just working with a legend? Do, what is your, you know, broad perspective on the entire arc of this genre provide them? You know, I think, uh, you know, I, I sometimes wonder about that. <laughs> Other than a higher booze tab. But, uh, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's just, some, there's some basic like flow principles, human interface. Um, and, and I think, you know, you really got to watch out. I mean, with the tech today, you, you've really got to kind of go that tightrope 
uh, of not completely overloading the player. You want to just take them to the point of absolute terror, but you know, you don't want to push them over the cliff too soon, you know? And so <laughs> there, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a balancing there and there's a, there's a, you know, how, how much can you really take? And, you know, you want it to kind of, so that it hurts so good, but not, not to, you know, just kill you in three seconds. Well, I wonder if like that younger generation of game develop- game developers are coming at it thinking like, okay, we need this to be hard. It seems like there's a fan base out there for hard games. And I mean, the go-to example is like, oh, we want to make the Dark Souls of an arcade experience. And you come from yeah. the earlier generations where it's like, oh, it has to be a brutal arcade game. So are you telling the younger generation to maybe be softer and to be less <laughs> Dark Souls than they want to be? <laughs> you know, I think, uh, thankfully, I think they, they ignore most of what I say. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not... Sadly, I'm not the target market for this game. I think there's there's some, uh, I mean, and, and the other thing you gotta realize is that in the last 40 or 50 years, I mean, uh, when Robotron came out, I mean, it's got two sticks. I mean, if you'd have come out with a dual shock controller in 1982, I mean, no one would have been able to handle it. I mean, it would have been just ex- incredible insanity. You know? They would have and burned so it like, on a cross, yeah. And I think that the player, the skill of the player uh, today's player is far out, you know, outstrips any kind of, uh, uh, player we had back in the eighties. And I think the, and also kind of just the spatial awareness of people that have, you know, lived video games, grown up with video games. I mean, it's, uh, it's really, um, I mean, we have some amazing, uh, esports type talent out there that, that can really deal with some of this stuff they're dishing out where, you know, I might, I might need a few, you know, few cheat codes and a immortality code or something to get through some of these levels. <laughs> <laughs> so you talk about like trying to stress, you know, making a clean design for, for house marks, uh, take on next mocking over there. Do you feel like that's something that's lost in modern video games, even on the triple a scale where there's just too much going on and it kind of loses that simplicity of clarity with old arcade experiences? You know, I think um, I think the cool thing, uh, yeah, I think there is a danger where you, you know, the graphics become becomes driving at everything, and and so you um, you spend all your time, and, and the graphics are always staring you in the face. So you always want to perfect that first, you know, because it's always it's like you know the dog, you know, put something bad on the carpet. You want to clean that up first, you know, and so these graphics are always hitting you in the face, and and I think you can overly focus on the look to the point of, uh, you know, and maybe we all, all game developers are kind of frustrated, uh, movie directors. And so we, 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 I think we get too involved with the look and the cinematography and, and don't focus on the gameplay and some of the strategic, the strategic flow, the tactics, kind of that rich interplay, especially like enemy dynamics, um, how the enemy reacts to the player, how to create, uh, you know, different tactical variety. Um, so that as you go from wave to wave, um, you can really get a, uh, you know, a, a, a non, a non uh, monotonous experience, you know, and it, it you know, it, it's, uh, so you really, I think the cool thing is um, they have a lot of the graphical stuff since they're, since there's so much algorithmically generated stuff in this game um, with the voxels and the particle beams, the particle explosions, um, they actually had a lot of time to really focus on the gameplay. And, and I think that's, you know, in the old school days, I mean, you only had like 10 pixels. So all you had was gameplay. And, and so I think now we're, this game is really putting the line in the sand on it's incredible, insane gameplay. <laughs> so what's been the most interesting part for you working for, you know, three years on this game now? Um, you know, I think it's just seeing the whole process, you know, just seeing the, um, I mean, it's it's amazing. Over over the last three and a half years, I mean, we've probably restarted the game two or three times, completely threw everything out. Um, you know, and, and there was some. I mean, at some point, like game number two, I thought it was pretty good. You know, and then I go to some meeting uh, in Helsinki and like, yeah, we threw everything out. You know, it sucks. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like when the creative consultant supposed to be bringing us the experts. Like, no, 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 we're good. Just shift this. Just shift this. <laughs> you know, I thought it, I thought it was good, but but it's like. Um, the, I mean, the, the team is really, these Finnish guys, I mean, there's a long winter up here, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, there's, there's, uh, after a while you even, even get tired of drinking. So you actually have to work and, 
and they're, they're, I mean, it's 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 amazing the talent here. It's 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 pretty. Uh, I mean, you think about some of the great, um, you know, titles even the, in the mobile era. You know, with Angry Birds and Supercell guys and all that stuff. I mean, uh, there's some amazing talent up here in uh, Scandinavia. What do you think that is? What is it about the culture? What have you learned about house mark house mark culture? Yeah, I think it's uh, um, the a really extreme focus, and I think the uh, since winter is so long, there's very little distraction. You know, I think I mean I remember years back, um, I think it was Konami or somebody was starting a studio in Hawaii, um, and and that nothing ever came out of the Hawaiian studio. You know, <laughs> I mean because. Who wants to work in Hawaii? I mean, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's like you're never going to create anything in Hawaii. Um, so you have to go to some really, you know, challenging climate where work is actually the most interesting thing. <laughs> so you're making a lot of trips over there? Um, just a couple, you know, and uh, I mean, it's a long flight. Uh, um, you know, I've been a bit, about once a year I've been out here and we do a lot of Skyping and and uh, we rendezvous in Chicago and uh had a great time at the at PSX. Uh, I guess it was back in December, um, but uh, you know it's amazing what we can do in Skype and just um, working the game on Steam and uh, back and forth. And you know, I mean, you know, these guys are Harry Kruger, who's the uh, uh, team leader on this thing. I mean, the guy is uh, incredible. He's, I mean, it's almost like we have ESP and 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 uh, you know answer each other's questions. So it's it's. It's amazing how how much they have really just kind of taken the ball and run with it, and um, you know, to the point where uh, you know I, I almost think like we're we're like mind melding sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so does it feel that different from your work at uh, Roth Reels? Does it feel like you're plugging back into a different uh, aspect of the game industry here? Yeah, it's really it, it is more about the hardcore experience. Where I mean, this is the the arcade was that was back in the early '80s. I mean. The arcade was the scene, you know. We didn't have mobile, we didn't have con- really console. Was just twenty six hundred, you know. There was a re- really no PC scene, um, no tablets, of course. And so the, um, uh, you know, it's it's kind of returned to that hardcore, pure gaming experience where the arcade now we the arcade we've evolved more to kind of uh, more casual but theatrical um, kind of adventure joyride type thing almost like a uh you know a roller coaster ride kind of a game where we we go for a really awesome you know visceral emotional experience of like you know four or five minutes and and that's really what people kind of want that little bite-sized thing where back in the in the in the day of the arcade i mean guys would play robotron for you know days and i think uh you know now we're coming back in the console there is that hardcore player that really wants to have a an incredible experience and play a game that could challenge them for for months so the old arcade fans are gravitating towards the downloadable scene on consoles and then the modern arcade experiences for people walking by who want something theatrical and they'll pop in a couple quarters yeah they just want to have a good time and and uh you know just have an adventure a quick adventure you know they don't want to you know sign up for a uh put give them the, give them your credit card for you know a monetization nightmare or anything <laughs> they just you know want to want to uh you know have a good time and and uh and really like li- like play a movie like uh Matt Roth Frills some of our recent titles uh The Walking Dead we did uh, recently Jurassic Park um and actually we did some retro stuff with Space Invaders and stuff but um it's experiences that are just they're kind of intense but very uh, very um, accessible to almost any level of skill and kind of really just go right to it and have a great time in a few minutes. Is it because I'm trying to think of like why a competitive scene wouldn't work in modern arcades? Is it just it needs kind of that culture and discussion and it's more passive these days? Um, I think it, it depends on the location. There actually is kind of a revival of a certain hardcore scene in kind of the barcade yeah. era and, uh, and, and which are really about um, I mean, some of them are more about drinking beer, but, <laughs> but there are, there's some, there's a real kind of a revival of, of really arcade players and in that barcade scene who are, who really want to play games. One game that is kind of cool tool. I don't know if you played it, it's called killer queen, no. uh, which is a 10 player, um, arcade experience, 10 player simultaneous, 
um, and it's uh, head to head two teams of five people. So it kind of it's kind of like the social um, team play kind of thing, which you know in Meet Space as opposed to on the on the internet. You know, <laughs> Meet Space. That's, so that's the scene that makes you the happiest when you're wandering through arcades. Is that barcade revival? I, I think that's it's cool to see such passionate. Uh, you know, passionate people about arcade gaming. And, uh, and so that it, it just, it, it's, it's kind of a new wrinkle that could, I think it's going to produce some, a whole new form, some whole new form of arcade games, Yeah, you know, which, which is, is, and, I, and there's a lot of, uh, within like the student and the indie game community, there's a lot of, um, uh, kind of one-off, uh, original arcade experiences. I mean, it's, it's nuts. I mean, people are actually creating like a one-off arcade game that's, you know, th- their passion and throwing it out in some of these barcades. And, and, and it's, it's just awesome to see kind of that new energy in the scene. Yeah, for sure. Hey, probably just because I was just there this weekend, but I'm curious what you think of Las Vegas and casinos when someone who has studied the arcade for their entire lives walks through a casino. Do you think there's anything that casino and that whole industry could learn from you guys and vice versa? Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, they are kind of similar, you know, and it's, it's, uh, the weird thing is it's kind of like the arcade, a lot of the arcade players of, you know, 20, 30 years ago are now in the casinos playing those games. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. <laughs> and then the, and the casino games have really incorporated. I mean, I don't know if you've, you've, uh, you know, been in the mood to waste a few hundred bucks, but the, <laughs> there's some amazing gameplay um in the in some of those casino games today and, and they've got you know massive curved screens and there's, there's some real spectacle going on in that in that game and actually some some former arcade designers are, are having great success in in that casino scene today it's interesting you call it gameplay you think i mean all the gameplay just looks idiotic and whenever i walk by we think some are actually interesting pieces of game design in there <laughs> There are. I mean, you, you know, you have to get about fifty bucks in to really see the good stuff. Oh, great! Okay, I'll test on everyone, Eugene. It's going to be an expensive process, but I think I can do it. <laughs> but no, there's some incredible bonus games that you can activate, uh, um, and uh, you know, it's it, it is um, a surprising the the amount of uh, great gameplay graphics that you see in some of the casino games. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, so. Just what's your perspective on the industry these days? Do you like to stay up to date on all the games coming out? Do you go to GDC every year? How much do you care about the modern video game industry outside of the arcades? You know, I uh, I, I do I do try to get around. Uh, I, I go to G, uh, GDC. I you know I'll be at Dice now and then. I'll check out. Uh, there's it's, it's kind of an interesting retro game community out there too. I like. I'll go around to some of the different retro uh, gaming shows, uh, pack shows. Uh, there's a really cool one out in uh, California, California Extreme, um, which is uh, a great retro arcade uh, and also a pinball show. And uh, I, I and I'm kind of a really my roots were pinball games, so I'm also seeing uh, this big revival in pinball, which yeah. is totally crazy, you know. And it's like, I, you know, I think uh, it's kind of a reaction to. Um, the weird thing is like, you know, video games, we kind of won, you know, now it's like everything is a freaking video game. I mean, Google's a video game. Your text editor is a video game. Your, you know, the internet, your, you know, the website of your, you know, Quicken Loans is a video game. Dating. I mean, it, it's like all of life is a video game now. And so I think people sometimes just like, Hey, let's go offline. And, and so it's weird how pinball is kind of this mechanical, actual 3d, entity and there's like this resurgence of interest in this kind of crazy electromechanical game um kind of i guess you know just something a break from from our screens you know people want to say yeah they're passionate about being the underdog and the underdog like fandom entertainment sector and it's like okay it's not video games anymore gotta go gotta go more niche old pinball that's the way to go (laughs) exactly you know but there is there is a a scene of, of making new pinball games and Although I guess one of the latest thing is putting in LCD screens in pinball games. So I don't know. I, I don't know if we can ever get away from these screens. They're too cruel. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to make you look in one into this interview. So looking back on your entire career, is there one period, yeah. one era that you're still fascinated by that you find yourself thinking a lot about? Um, I, I guess obviously the craziest era I think is back in, you know, the, the f- a few years back in the early eighties when I was, uh, just the just the crazy titles, Defender, Robotron, you know, Stargate, uh, um, 
and then you know narc smash tv i you know kind of that golden era you know and it's just um when two guys you know could go into a, a closet and crank out a game in six months and and be on top of the world you know and it's it, it's it, there was a great kind of rush and it was kind of like being an author almost you know like when you're writing a book you don't have like a team of a thousand people you know it's just a couple of guys very personal handcrafted message of a of authors you know and so it was kind of a magical creative era which kind of came back a bit i think in the in the app era you know in the mobile era with you know there was kind of this incredible um revolution of you know kind of the new touchscreen interface and stuff like you know angry birds and candy crush and um you know all the uh there was like i remember doodle jump i love that game and um just an incredible amount of of great apps that have been come out of the mobile community and you know the um um it was just just un- fruit ninja you know yeah but there's just something it's, sweet about like having that time just express yourself quickly just get an idea out there get feedback maybe make money go back do it again it's just that quick turnaround that's what that's the exactly. thrill for you yeah, and you kind of just you're feeding off the energy of, of the players and really you know interfacing uh you know just and then it's kind of the simplicity of not having a hundred man team to do something you know just kind of go out with with just an idea and and, and a prayer you know <laughs> yeah yeah i guess so could you ever see yourself getting back to that super small team mentality because house mark i mean that's still a decently sized team right yeah i mean they got you know probably you know all told maybe 15 20 guys on the game all right at some point you know um you know obviously you've got all the specialties now you know you've got sound guys you got you know character rigging you know particle guys um there's there's you know the whole whole specialized programming uh, and, you know, it's almost kind of like a mini Hollywood thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, the, I, I mean, uh, unfortunately, I think my tech chops are a little rusty, you know, so I think, <laughs> I think I'm going to, you know, I, I really need, I'm more of a, more of a, a manager than a, than a coder these days. I don't think, I don't think you want to see my code in a game. Anymore, <laughs> <but> I, <laughs> Does a game like Next Machina still feel personal for you though? Or do you think it still feels as personal as Robotron is to you for every single person that worked on this new game? I think so. Yeah. Um, and because I mean, everybody's crafting, you know, it's just like, I think at, at house market, you know, they're, they're really kind of that, that craftsmanship, those long winners, you know, if, you know, if your whole thing was creating plasma beams, I mean, you know, the, uh, the technical artists doing that stuff really, really threw their souls into that and crafted, you know, crafted this, this, uh, incredible game. And so I think you really, as you play the game, you see, you see kind of the craftsmanship and the love. I mean, you kind of call it putting the love in a game, you know, and like you can tell when a game is not loved and, you know, it, it kind of falls flat. It's and, it, and it's like true love of developing a game. It's putting crap in there that is really not necessary. You know, it's like it's that extra little polish, you know, that extra little thing that that makes you feel cool. Maybe no one will ever notice that, but that's like true love in game development. True love is just willing to burn your weekends and stay late. Exactly, exactly. Burn your life to to get the ultimate uh, particle beam, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you, you've been in the industry for so long, uh, in a good way. I'm wondering, is there, yeah. do you have a favorite developer out there? Do you feel like there's some undersung uh, heroes that there are out there of game development that you have really been impressed by throughout your years? Um, God, you know, there's... Uh, it would it would be there'd be too many to name. I mean, yeah. they're just so so many um, incredible. I mean, right now the the you know there's what there's like what, two million apps on the, on the or ten million apps. I don't know what it is, but um, there's such a um, you know cornucopia of games out there. I mean, it's I, I don't think gamers have ever had a better chance to to play amazingly innovative product. Um, and you know, obviously with with now you know the online stuff and with steam just opening it up for indie developers and things um god it's it just it's a golden era and it's kind of like you know if you don't if you don't like what games you see out there go make go make a game of your own man it's like it's 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 wide open for anybody that has it has the uh the time and, and the insanity do are some of your old games uh have they been ported to ios um you know i think uh 
you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't think there's been literal ones. I mean, there was, there was a lot of porting, uh, to the, um, to the consoles, you know, but, uh, um, I, I don't think there's been, uh, I don't think any completely, you know, uh, faithful reproductions. And it, I mean, it's kind of tough because especially like a twin stick shooter, yeah, it's really hard to, to get that interface, um, you know, with a touch screen, you yeah. know, and, uh, it always, it's, it, I, it's funny how it really is hard to, a hardcore joystick game is very hard to emulate with the, with the iPad. I mean, uh, it's kind of like iOS can do the touch screen that allows you to do all these new genres really cool, but it's that, I think that's one thing it suffers on and it just yeah i don't know i i love i love having like the joysticks physically attached to something huge that i can just like wrestle with and and uh, you know like throw around almost you know uh, <laughs> so you're not into the meme scene as much then do you feel like it loses something when it's emulated on a computer yeah i do i really do because you, you just don't you know unless you, you can really get a great control but you know i think there's always a compromise when you when you have a general control system um i was always really picky like exactly the length the shaft on the robotron knobs and you know it's like a big deal to me you know it's like um i, I don't, probably nobody gives a shit really but it was a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> i get it man hey uh real quick i want to pick your mind on some of the greatest arcade games that maybe people don't know about what do you think uh, what arcade uh, games are under the radar that you've always really appreciated you're welcome to say some of your own as well um you know i guess uh uh, you know, I'd lo- obviously, uh, let me th- some of the obscure ones. I mean, there was a, a super obscure game uh, uh, by a guy named uh, um, Tim Skelly, uh, who was uh, a designer back in the day for Cinematronics, and uh, um, and I, I think there's there's amazing uh, uh, vector games uh, that he worked on. Um, but I, I guess one thing that uh, I think was done by uh, uh, I think the guy's name was Warren Davis, I believe, um, and maybe in, in, maybe with Tim Skelly. It was called Reactor. Yeah. It was a very obscure uh, arcade game where you were kind of trying to uh, balance a nuclear core that was melting down. And uh, God, I don't even know if this if, if that even exists anymore. But uh, <laughs> it, it it will be on on main, you know, and uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, particle physics and, and crazy stuff like that. Um, the, uh, there was actually a very crazy game, uh, also in the vector era. It was called oops. Ooh. And I have no idea who did this one, but it was, uh, actually it was about birth control. What? And, and uh, I guess, I think you, you were actually, I forget if you were the sperm or the egg, but <laughs> there, was, there was, there was, I think you were maybe defending the egg. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, if you, if you messed up one of the sperm got in, then it was, that was oops. So, uh, is this an American so that game? Kind of that sounds bizarre, great. A very bizarre title. Uh, um, it, it, you know, the weirdest thing was, uh, I remember, it's funny where I was, we were doing uh, smash TV and we had a, uh, a young lady, uh, um, I think her name was Lynn Young and she was our, our artist. And, uh, and she wanted, you know, she was like, uh, we were brainstorming, like, what is our next game? You know? And she's like, you know, I want to make a game about growing plants. And we're like, just cracking up, like, what a stupid idea that would be. You know, like, who would ever play a game about growing pant- plants? You know, this is like, it's like watching paint dry or something. And, you know, of course, you know, two decades later, Farmville, you know, <laughs> you know uh, even Harvest it, Moon takes off. Yeah, yeah. There's an audience for that stuff, man. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we could have, we could have had Farmville, you know, two decades before, you know, but you know, it's, Ooh, uh, you know, some, some visionaries have their blind spots, you know. What I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, before I let you go, I would love to hear the story of uh, your cameo on news radio. Ah, I'm a yeah, huge was... news radio fan. Uh, what what was that whole saga like? How did it come to be? You popped up in the episode where Dave Foley's character got addicted to Stargate Defender, I do believe. Right, right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that was crazy. It was uh, so the producers on the show were like uh, one of the, one of the producers in particular. I think his name was Paul something or other. Was it Paul Sims? And, and uh, totally into, he was just like a total Stargate addict, you know, and like, so he's like trying to, how do I 
how do I somehow fit Stargate into a plot, you know, <laughs> uh, this radio? And uh, and then he's like, yeah, you know, you got to come down to the studio and, you know, see all this stuff. And like, OK, you know, and uh, um, so I get down there and uh, it was it was pretty wild. You know, just the whole Hollywood scene of I mean, they'd be shooting, uh, you know, they they it's it, everything's happens. It's such a warp speed in Hollywood. I mean, every week they make an entire show, you know, it's like, and I used to like video games, you spend like years and years, you know, and, <laughs> you know, you may never finish the damn thing. But um, I mean, literally like in a week, you know, they, Monday morning, they come in like, okay, what the hell are we going to make our show about? You know, and they're like, okay, blah, blah. They start writing stuff. They start cranking stuff. And then they're shooting. I, I guess what on you know, Thursday or Friday, they start shooting and they could shoot half the show and go, you know, this is not working. We need to rewrite, you know, and then they, some guy comes, you know, script, you know, the pr- script guys and writers come up and they'll like rewrite the show on the spot in like half an hour, you know, and then continue shooting. And, uh, um, yeah, it was just wild, you know, seeing, uh, you know, Phil Hartman and, yeah. all, and all the talent on, on the show and just kind of kind of hanging out in the Hollywood studio for a day. It was uh, kind of a, kind of a dream to come to. And I, I got to be delivery man, uh, number two. So, uh, so how does that awesome. work? Do people like do the other actors? Does Phil Hartman know who you are, what you're doing on set, or is it just like, oh, I guess there's some other extra here, no big deal? Yeah, it was just some weird guy, you know. And they gave me some, uh, you know, they dressed me up. They had like the delivery man costume, and uh, you know, I, you know, they're just they're they're so into their um, you know their own thing that you know who's this? I mean, video game guy, whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but Paul Sims you know, was like kissing your ass the whole time. That must have been nice. Uh, the producer, you know, the producers, I, I think there was like, some of the guys are like, oh man, this is amazing. Other guys like, who the f*** is this guy? <laughs> and I was like, you know, let's get on with the show. What is this? You know, come on. It's just fanboy crap. We got it. We got a, we got a sitcom to, to, uh, to shoot, you know, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but it was, it was an awesome day to just see how Hollywood worked out. And I wish as game, as game developers, we could do that. We could like design a game in a week, you know, just like crank it out and like boom you know just it'd be so fun to take like a talented studio like a you know crazy studio like a naughty dog or a rock star and just keep them on that schedule just like hey you'll be doing a game jam every week throughout the entire year and we'll release it all in one bundle people would be super into that yeah i mean that that would be uh like a different chapter every every uh, you know different dlc every week i i just the toughest thing in games though it's like it seems like you know, your first pass is always garbage, you know? <laughs> so it's like, it's kind of, you know, somehow you, you it always is like, you know, you, you think you're going to do it in a week, but then it's like you redo it two or three times and then finally it's good, you know? And that's, <laughs> that's always, that's always a tough thing uh, in game development. It's, you, you're never done. Yeah. But uh, life's going well for you these days? You know, it's, 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 it's cool, man. It's, uh, the crazy thing is there's kind of like this arcade revival, you know, which is, uh, I can't, you know, it's like my entire uh, life, it seems like, you know, people would ask me, well, what are you doing, Gene? And I'm like, hey, you know, what's going on? I'm like, oh, you know, I'm doing arcade games. I'm like, oh, yeah, didn't that like die like 30 years ago, you know? And, uh, you know, it's, it's like, well, no, dude, they still have them, you know? <laughs> and it's like, but actually now it seems like there, and there actually is kind of an upswing in, in the arcade scene. And uh, um, I think partly um, we're able to do, um, just some really crazy uh, titles, and we, you know, there's like we got these super big screens now. In fact, we're doing this um, the Space Invaders game that has a like a ten foot tall LED screen. So we have every pixel from the original Space Invaders is a LED, and so we got like it's like I don't know sixty thousand uh, LED lights, and it's like this super intense. You almost go blind playing this thing, but <laughs> that sounds it, awesome. But it's like the ultimate retro, you know, it's a, you know, 10 foot uh, Space Invaders. And we threw, we, we kind of mixed it up a little bit. We threw a couple of machine guns in there just to keep things fresh, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. It's bizarre. Well, hey, anything else you want to talk about, Eugene, before I let you go? I, you know, I think that's cool. I think it's fine, man. I just want to say, you know, I love your magazine, man. Oh, I love your show, man. You guys, it's just, you got such, you know, Game Informer has just been there for players forever. And man, you guys keep going, man, because it's it's awesome, man. I, I just, I, lo- I love reading your stuff and seeing your stuff online. God bless you, Mr. Drivers. Thank you so much for those kind words. Well, thank you so much yeah. for joining us. And thank you to everybody that watched or listened to this episode of the Game Informer Show. Be sure to tune in next Thursday and we'll have a new episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody.
Now the camera reminds me of Johnny Five. Why don't you kiss it, you pervert? Mm. It is a crime. A poster that, on your wall. That, that we got I only got two short circuit movies, but there are seven Leprechaun movies. That really oh, is sad. That's what sick. universe could he be in? Is there a crossover opportunity with Johnny Five? So I what, mean, if you can put in Marv, if, if you can put Howard the Duck in Guardians of the Galaxy, you can put fucking Johnny Five in something. Well, yeah, something. But I'm what, Transformers. Who owns him? Uh, who, put him in Transformers. I bet Marvel does. Put him in. Put Just him in Guardi- Disney in general. Guardians of the Galaxy. What doesn't Disney own these Actually, days? Why? Yeah. Why did they not make a third? Was it because Gutenberg was so expensive? No, you need to look <laughs> up the movie. I mean, show. at the time, I thought. It lo- a, you need to look up the movie, okay. not the term. I thought that the not I, the term that the movie is hey, based Jamie, off. Hey, I thought that's what I was doing. All right, so <laughs> yeah, but you took like shut four your whole seconds because I'm trying. I was trying to figure out if this was a screenshot from the movie because <laughs> there are explosions in the movie. No, it's just it's just tree limbs. I bet uh, it, it seems like the type fire. of movie that'd be in the same universe as like Mac and me. <laughs> And other rejected weirdos. <laughs> I do love. Is I it, want an Expendables of like just terrible yeah. C tier mascots. That's have basically you, what the plot of Cars Two is. Have you seen all of, all of the Paul Rudd instances where he keeps showing Mac and me on Conan O'Brien? <laughs> oh, it's amazing! <laughs> oh my god! Dude. Anytime, <laughs> anytime Paul Rudd is on Conan's show with like, oh, we've got a clip from your from your movie. Let's watch it. It's never a clip from the movie. It's always just this one part from Mac and Me where a it's kid so in a wheelchair fl- like flies down a hill. <laughs> and and there's like compilations where they show every time he's done it and somehow it never gets less funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We should really do that garbage Dragon Ball Z podcast. Here, here let's make Shut this a garbage up, one. I want to. 16 things you probably never knew about the short circuit movies. They're, no, they're, that is not a listicle on the internet. They're technically watchable. Number one, director John Badham <laughs> wanted Johnny Five to look like he was from 50 to 100 years in the future. Oh, boy. Number two, it took a dozen people to operate Johnny Five at one time. When Badham screened a rough cut of the first movie for audiences, he got annoyed at Johnny Five's constant chattering. Wait, he did? He did. Hmm. Yeah. Wait, the director was annoyed by the movie he made? Yeah, he said, I found myself saying to number five, shut up. Stop chattering so much. But he only noticed this once the... When it was being screened. <laughs> was he thinking of... Was he in the audience? I don't know. Maybe don't know. maybe there's a, a... You know, that's a moment in which you're tuned into how other people might be perceiving it. Yeah, you're yeah. self-conscious for the first yeah. time. Uh, there are callbacks to his earlier films, such as Saturday Night Fever. Who cares? Uh, really? Wilson and his co-writer, Brent Maddock, couldn't figure out how Johnny Five comes to life. Johnny Five was originally going to be stop motion. Oh. Number seven, Johnny wait, Five wait, had wait. a third arm. Oh, I'm just <laughs> happy to see me. What about the, uh, go back a couple. He couldn't figure Robo out how Dick. they came to life. Was yeah. that just the end? Like they just realized while writing it, we don't know where he came from. Let's move on. My first thought was it could be a person who had been mechanized oh. until only his brain <laughs> remained intact. Kill me. But Did- his co-writer threw a fit about it because it was so grisly. So we started. Jesus. Yeah. So, so they just crazy. destiny did then. They're like, yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. No, no, no. Fine. I thought I thought he got like struck by lightning or something. Oh yeah, I think that is what happened. I think that's how he that's how he like gained sentience. Let's see. I didn't finish reading that thing. So, but wait, that's so he's normally just like a dumb okay. toaster robot. Number eight, Johnny Five was going to be painted jungle camouflage in Arctic white at various points. Oh. Horror director Wes Craven recycled Johnny Five's chassis for his killer robot movie Deadly Friend. Can't recycle a chassis. Yeah. They killed Johnny Five and they recycled did. him. They built five uh, heads for Johnny Five. They all looked bad. <laughs> <laughs> they built fifteen versions of Johnny Five, and the fifth version actually short circuited. Oh no! <laughs> That's awesome. That's very. Uh, Ali Sheedy thought of Johnny Five as a real co-star. <laughs> <laughs> no one had the heart to tell him. <laughs> uh, early audiences booed their relationship. <laughs> Uh, Ben, the Indian scientist, Mm -hmm. started out as a WASP, which is an acronym for something. What does that mean? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Protestant. Oh, for a second I thought it was something else. Yeah, for a second it was actually an interesting fact. (laughs) Uh, 15, Indian audiences thought Ben really was from India. Okay, and 16, Ali Sheedy was deemed too expensive for the sequel. I'm guessing that might have happened with uh, the third one then. Maybe Gutenberg was too much. 
because that was in his peak, right? Mm-hmm. So they probably just decided to screw it. The idea of Ali Sheedy being too expensive. Who's <laughs> Ali Sheedy? <laughs> she, was she was in actress. Breakfast Club. She was a big deal. Mm-hmm. She had the black hair in Breakfast Club, mm-hmm. right? She was she like a goth girl, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Oh. The goth before there were goth. She, alive? she turned into a princess at the end. Hey, are we going to do a podcast? Yeah.